our second uh, our second regular agenda item of the day. <laughs> holy holy. <laughs> Uh, this is buildings. Receive a, a presentation on uh, the uh, on education code overview and uh, 4290 fire safe regulations. Good afternoon. I won't take up much of our time because I know we're is because we're staying on schedule here. I wanted to not go overboard and say too much. Uh, the presentation before you today is an educational piece, and it has to do with law that is has been in place. Some laws here that we're going to talk about today have been in place for 25 years. And other code references are eight years old, 10 years old, et cetera. So the Butte fire has not caused what we're going to see today to be a new uh, barrage of codes. It's the information here that we're going to provide for you today is strictly inform instructional information based on what the current codes are and what the expectations of fire planning and proper construction and uh, fuel mitigation and access and water supply can do to better enhance the emergency services as well as the public when such events occur that have been occurring more numerously throughout the state as time goes on. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Chief, Chief Newman, who is a battalion chief of uh, CAL FIRE with the planning use, fire planning use, and he will uh, begin with his presentation and uh, we'll go through the PowerPoint and we'll have time for public comment and any, any questions that are relative. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors for Calaveras County, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Newman. As uh, Mr. White mentioned, I'm a Division Chief representing CAL FIRE, the Office of the State Fire Marshal, uh, Land Use Planning Program, out of the Southern Region Headquarters in Riverside, California. I want to thank you very much for your time this afternoon and placing CAL FIRE on the agenda. In attendance, I'd also like to acknowledge the Calaveras County Fire Chiefs Association, members of the uh, local fire districts, as well as Tuolumne Calaveras <laughs> Unit Chief, uh, Chief Joshua White, uh, Chief Morantz, and Chief Frazee, uh, Board of Forestry, uh, Ms. Enith Hannigan, um, Deputy Chief, uh, Office of the State Fire Marshal, Pete Manoa, and Assistant Chief, uh, Land Use Plan Program in the Southern Region, uh, Jeff Isaacs, uh, Fire Captains Lindo and Moxley. I'm here today to provide a brief overview of Title 14, the Natural Resources Code, and subsection 1270 um, that went into effect January 1st of this year, and encouraging Calaveras County to formally adopt these requirements and these regulations and in their local ordinance have them certified through the Board of Forestry. I'd like to start off with the uh, five largest fires in Calaveras County. Uh, this information was obtained through the uh, Community Wildfire Protection Plans, the technical report series from the general plan for the safety element, the local uh, hazard mitigation plans, as well as the local unit fire plans. If you look at um, number five, the history from the past uh, 20 plus years, the Leonard Fire, 2001, 5,167 acres, 22 structures destroyed. Rank coming in at number four in 1998, the Bridge Fire, 6,778 acres. In 2001, the Darby Incident, over 14,000 acres, one structure destroyed. 1992, the Old Gulch Fire, 17,386 acres, 170 structures destroyed. And what's fresh in everybody's mind is the fire that occurred in the fall of 2015, the Butte Fire, with uh, over 70,000 acres, 921 structures destroyed, and two fatalities. We brought a picture of the uh, fire history that goes back to 1950s. We're looking at some of the fire data that uh, we've researched going back to the 40s and some of the, uh, the documents, the community wildfire protection plans, local hazard mitigation plans. The polygons on the wall there depict uh, the fires uh, that, have, uh, that have occurred in, uh, in Calaveras County. We're looking at Calaveras as, County as a whole and, in, and looking at the state of California. Calaveras County is an area at risk. And we're here to reduce those risks, assist the local government, with providing mitigation measures to reduce these impacts, reduce this devastation from occurring in the future. So as a whole, we'll look at uh, the 10 uh, most damaging fires in the state of California. Down number 10, we have the Sire Fire, Los Angeles County, over 11,000 acres, 604 structures destroyed. Fountain Fire, August, in Shasta County, over 63,000 acres. 
going up to the Butte Fire, which is fresh in everybody's mind, made it to number seven of the top ten, over 70,000 acres. Uh, then, of course, we have the Tunnel Fire, Oakland Hills, comes in at number one. That was uh, 1,600 acres, over 2,900 structures destroyed, and 25 deaths. So that brings us to uh, Public Resource Code 4290. And the question is, what is 4290? 4290 is the authority of the Board of Forestry to establish uh, minimum fire and life safety requirements for new construction in the state responsibility areas. We'll be focusing on access, water supply, fuel modification, and vegetation management. So what are the requirements of the California Code of Regulations, Title 14, uh, Section 1270? We look at this as, uh, as methodology to support as a vehicle for uh, Public Resource Code 4290. So we'll be looking at the road standards, the access, and the equipment. So looking at access, looking at the, uh, the access road, uh, routes, um, the widths of the road, roadway services, uh, the grades, the radius, the turning radius. Can the turning radius for the proposed development, can it accommodate a, a type one engine, a type three engine in these certain applications? Also looking at the roadway grades, if they exceed 16% in certain applications. Looking at the roadway surfaces, if they're all weather surface or they're going to be aggregate, uh, they're able to withstand 75,000 pounds GVW. Um, looking at the pictures uh, on the screen, looking at in, inadequate access. And this is important what we look at from a fire and life safety standpoint. Uh, incorporating the codes, adopting the codes uh, from the state um, regulations, but also for an Alvarez Fire Department. The local jurisdictions here in Calaveras County, in cooperation with uh, CAL FIRE, the means of ingress and egress for uh, EMS, uh, or rescue situations. So it applies in a fire application, but it also applies in an all-risk situation as well, too. So there's a lot of parallels, a lot of benefits to the uh, uh, adoption of the codes. So we look at road standards, uh, access, and equipment. We look at the, uh, the turnarounds, the turnouts for uh, various uh, developments. Uh, sometimes you'll see these in development plans as a hammerhead configuration, uh, a dead end uh, T or a bubble, but it has the ability for fire apparatus to uh, make a turnaround. But also what's important for the ingress and egress, the access and the turnarounds, is for the civilians to evacuate in the event of emergency, working in conjunction with the EMS, working in conjunction with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, fire Department uh, personnel can defend those structures uh, if needed and also have the ability for uh, um, the civilians to evacuate in a timely and safe manner. Um, we also look at the driveways. The driveway, if they're all weather surface, we look at the gate entrances to accommodate uh, ingress and egress of fire vehicles as well as uh, civilians escaping. Looking at bridges, the bridge component is to comply with the requirements that are identified within the uh, municipal codes for Calaveras County, uh, Department of Transportation Standards. Can those bridges withhold uh, the weight of a, a fire apparatus, numerous fire apparatus that have to park there for uh, a continued period of time? Whatever the situation may dictate, plan for the worst case scenario, worst case disaster. So we'll also look at uh, the, uh, the street signs, the signage, um, size, letters, numbers, and symbols for the streets. Uh, the visibility, legibility of the street signs, uh, the height of the street signs, uh, numbers, uh, intersecting roads. An example would be uh, that could be identified in a local hazard mitigation plan, escape routes, evacuation routes for the local citizens, uh, making uh, people aware of the, the local hazards on which way to escape in the event of a, a wildland incident. Uh, also looking at the road standards from an EMS component for uh, advanced life support, uh, rendering, rendering uh, medical aid, um, addresses, contrasting color, four inches with a, a half inch stroke. Uh, visibility from the street is a key component here. Uh, the installation of uh, the private uh, road signs, if they're clearly identified, if numerous structures are on a uh, rural road, if they're clearly identified and grouped together for um, easy access to get into that area. Uh, we also look at the installation and visibility of addresses, as I mentioned. A lot of times you'll find these standards identified in the municipal code as well, similar to the street standards, also in the uh, circulation element of the general plan for the local jurisdiction. So we also look at water resources. We look at water mains. We look at um, the parallels with the, uh, the California Fire Code, the California Building Code. Um, National Fire Protection Association 1142 looks at uh, rural um, water supply, whether it's going to be a backup generation, 
where there's going to be mechanisms in place, a contingency plan to support that fire flow for fire operations. Here's a picture of a water tank. So does that water tank, the question that we would have through plan review in the building and safety department, would that uh, tank uh, meet the requirements, the fire flow requirements that the building official and the fire official would look at? Can the local jurisdiction uh, have adequate access to that fire, that fire tank to suppress that fire? Some of the things we also look at are lakes, ponds, swimming pools as uh, alternate water sources to uh, suppress those fires and private water systems as, as well. So we also look at fuel breaks, fuel modification considerations. We look at uh, roadside development, right of way. If there's a right of way easement with uh, PG&E for an example, uh, a right of entry to maintain um, that vegetation. Um, it also comes into compliance with uh, Public Resource Code 4292, 4293, tree line contact, uh, also um, <coughs> around the, uh, the power pole. So this is an example here of before and after of uh, vegetation that's overgrown, possibly dead and dying vegetation, working with uh, community wildfire protection groups, firewise groups, maybe through a grant program. They were, had the ability to clear that vegetation. So we looked at that as one example of, um, of uh, vegetation management, uh, reducing that fuel from a surface fire, getting into the, uh, the canopy, the ladder fuels, getting into the uh, timber, and then it uh, goes tree to tree ignition. We also look at um, uh, planning of the power lines, as I mentioned in um, the public resource code, and the uh, power utility systems, having a, a good working relationship with uh, local power companies. So here's, as I mentioned, a um, collaborative effort with uh, CAL FIRE as, as well as with the USDA Forest Service. I'm showing a, an illustration of, uh, of success, um, either through grant funds, uh, through public participation, they were able to clear that uh, vegetation to reduce the impacts, reduce that fire, and reduce that fire spread in a particular area. So just as a recap, looking at subsection 127003, the local ordinances. Uh, the board can certify local ordinances that meet or exceed or provide for the same practical effect, the minimum state requirements. Uh, it's a process that allows the county to utilize their local ordinances through the county instead of having two different sets of standards in the SRA, State Responsibility Area, and the Unincorporated LRA, Local Responsibility Area. It allows the county to utilize a set of countywide standards that better meet the unique geographic, climate, topographic, and the fire risk characteristics of the county and the statewide minimum requirements. So basically, Calaveras County, to bring it down to a local level, identified as an area at risk. Certification of the ordinances uh, through the Board of Forestry review. Um, <coughs> Well, through the review, we'll have a clear understanding for developers that come into Calaveras County. They'll have a clear set of uh, uh, laws, ordinances, regulations, and standards when they work with the planning department, the fire department, and the building and safety department, public works department as well. So looking at um, after action reports, post-incident analysis, we look at San Diego, what transpired, um, looking at fire history from those previous slides identified in the beginning of the presentation. Back in 2003, San Diego County uh, had a fire siege lasting approximately 15 days. Uh, there were 14 major fires that burned over 750,000 acres in Southern California. 24 people lost their lives. One firefighter uh, lost his life uh, combating those wildland fires out of Nevada, California for the Nevada Fire Department. Um, basically, this looked at uh, change for the future. We look at the, uh, the fire codes uh, being reactive. We collect data and how could we affect change in the future. San Diego County was very instrumental with uh, folks at the Office of the State Fire Marshal as well as CAL FIRE, working with the San Diego County Fire Authority, Building and Safety Planning Department to enhance their fire code. Uh, look at their, the, the model codes and what they did is they had codes that were more restrictive than uh, the state required codes. So basically in a recap, the Witch Fire, Harris Fire, and Pramacha Fire in 2007, there were 8,300 8, homes in that, uh, that burn area. Uh, 1,047 were destroyed, looking at a loss rate of approximately 13%. So post uh, 2003, uh, San Diego County being very instrumental. So as the plants came through, uh, in 2004, um, they had those new building codes. Um, 1,218 homes were in that area under the 2004 code. 24 of those homes were destroyed at a loss rate of two thousand. Uh, a loss rate, I'm sorry, two percent. So look at that as a success story. 
And what it did is it had the opportunity for these, those structures for survival. But one of the important things we look at for home survival, looking at laws, ordinances, regulations, and standards, is the safety of the community. In addition to the safety of the community is the safety for the firefighters. Safety for your firefighters here in Calaveras County and Cal Fire and cooperating agencies uh, from throughout the state of California. So we look at the formulas for success. We look at the components of uh, EMS as I identified, having uh, uh, appropriate signage in compliance with um, local hazard mitigation plans, emergency operation plans, uh, and the various plans and documents that support the general plan for the county, how that county is going to grow and develop for the next 10 years. So well, EMS is a, an important component. We look at uh, 90, approximately 90% of our calls that we respond to in the fire department are EMS related. So there's benefits from the fire standpoint, uh, defensible space, but as well as EMS. We look at uh, local hazard mitigation plans as identified, looking at goals, policies, and implementation measures within those documents that support other documents. We're bringing it all together. Uh, the building codes, as we mentioned, the county fire plan. Some jurisdictions will also have standards of cover or local fire and EMS master plan. And very important through the, uh, the planning process. Um, the local officials, such as yourself, um, such as the sphere of influence, other individuals, uh, the planning commission, city councils, very important in this process. Community wildfire protection groups that identify the areas at risk, work in conjunction with uh, the fire department, law enforcement, and EMS. Very important. The fire department, as we mentioned, is a crucial part. Fire department is the last line of defense. We uh, look at uh, uh, the fire prevention planning uh, standpoint. We're going to plan, uh, engineer, and educate the citizens, but also provide information. Like we're doing today is providing information to the, uh, the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have the fire safe regulations as I identified. The local unit fire plans for Calaveras County comes in the form of a strategic master plan. It, um, it narrows its focus down into geographic areas of responsibilities and what we call battalions, divisions and a better way to serve the, uh, the community with identifying those hazards at risk. So we also have land use planning. As a representative from the land use planning, our main focus is applying departments for uh, jurisdictions. The lead agency is responsible for submitting information in the form of a general plan. Our main focus is a safety element. So we work collectively with all these groups and local hazard mitigation plans, emergency <coughs> operation plans, to get the information from the Board of Forestry in the form of recommendations to enhance our safety element, to reduce large-scale disasters from occurring. We reduce the large cost of uh, wildland fires and the participation with, uh, with agencies. Reduce that risk through long-range planning. So we also have the Fire Safe Council, similar to the Community Wildfire Protection <coughs> Plans, and of course, law enforcement. So that concludes the presentation. I know it went through it uh, uh, very quick. Uh, we look at uh, the land use planning program. We are here to analyze the past, cherish the present as we plan for the future. There's a paradigm shift uh, with our group in the state of California. And with the participation today um, from various agencies, we're at a point now where we need to maximize our similarities and minimize our differences as we plan for the future and long-range planning. That concludes the presentation. I'm available for any questions. Uh, I got a quick question for you. Um, you know, thanks for the presentation. Uh, very, very quick. I like that, uh, but yet informative. Um, the question I have, you know, I don't think anybody can argue that uh, the new uh, fire codes um, help prevent uh, destruction of houses. Um, do you see, like, one of the problems that I, I, I foresee is just a, a driving up in the cost of, of building those houses. Um, it, it, do you have any factor uh, or a number on how much more it costs to, to build these newer uh, homes than, than before? Those are exact figures. I don't know what the, uh, I don't know if you call it compute, um, consumer price index for the cost per square foot. I don't have that information. But that could be a that could be a factor as well, and I think the uh, the building industry would have a better handle of that local uh, uh, contractors and developers. And beyond that, um, to uh, to actually improve your uh, driveway in and out adds cost to building as well. Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. Right. So, are you are you going to be stopping people from um, being able to build on their property? Well, that would be a local decision, um, the authority having jurisdiction for uh, fire and building. Um, certainly, we look at the, uh, 
the requirements of, uh, of um, 1270. But as far as uh, those requirements, I think that would be a discussion at a later, later time. But, but if we adopt something like this, it's going to be it going to our general plan, then you're, it's set in stone. And then, uh, you know, for uh, some of these folks, you know, uh, building some of these, these roads would be impossible for them to even consider building on their property. Right. And I understand. And, and um, speaking with the, uh, the, the executive staff in San Diego County in the aftermath of their fire, they had similar challenges. But uh, the approach that they, uh, they had was, um, was working independently outside a, uh, a public arena and um, coming up with, uh, with a work plan and how they're going to move forward. And it was a long process. So even today, after talking to some of the building officials and fire marshals in San Diego County, they're not 100% uh, built from, uh, from the aftermath of uh, 03, 07. Is it because they implemented something like this? I don't have an answer for you. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's preventing some of our folks from rebuilding. Sure. And, and you look at it from a fire marshal's perspective, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So there's also alternative methods and materials that are identified within the, uh, the California Fire and Building Code that can be utilized um, in, in certain circumstances. So I think at this point, um, it would probably be a case-by-case -case basis and something that uh, would have to work with the executive staff of the county. Yeah, I think it's a it is a it's a, a, a major uh, problem, you know, uh, in these you know largely rural areas where you have a lot of folks who are just struggling, you know, to get by. And this is one of the few affordable places you can actually live. You know, you can buy a house and and you can live here. You know, <laughs> and without uh, you know, and, and so instead of a small tiny apartment somewhere, in, you know, in, in in an urban area, you can actually have. Uh, a house and acreage, you know, and, and live pretty well on a much lower uh, uh, level of income. And so there's a concentration that, you know, of disadvantaged communities, um, you know, throughout our county and the region. And so I think just uh, making sure that, that uh, that's recognized, you know, the housing affordability and the, like Cliff was saying, part of that is the, uh, like even doing a, a minor, uh, just a partial split. Um, sometimes, you know, becomes impossible because of the road improvements that are necessary to reach that. So sure. what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to make it safe for everybody, you know, so for the poor people and the rich people. Uh, but I also don't want, I want to make sure that the, the poor people are able to actually get the permits legally and build legally so they can have insurance. So when a fire does come through, they're protected. But I don't, you know, I mean, so that's the, <coughs> the struggle that I'm having uh, in dealing with these, these codes. Um, it's just a very real... Uh, set of problems uh, and so I'm looking for uh, any guidance you could direct me to, to read about or talk to folks that have you know dealt with this uh, on, a, on a implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, Sup Supervisor Wright, you're 100% correct and the, the main topic here is safety. So we look at the safety of the community that you identified but we also look at the, uh, the safety of the firefighters and looking at the laws, ordinances, regulations and standards, it comes with intent and, the int and what was the intent of that code and the intent here is, uh, is fire and life safety. So if you look at actually the, the road width for an example, it's designed for ingress and egress, but also in certain applications it's for uh, rescue for firefighting personnel. So that's one of the key points that we look at as well in looking at uh, tough e economic times that we've experienced uh, nationwide in the, the past few years. Um, budgets are getting cut, fire departments are getting cut. So we look at that as a, as a challenge in the fire service community as well. But by looking at uh, those laws uh, during the planning phase for new development, I think that's, that's crucial. Uh, those, uh, unfortunately, are the requirements for, um, for new construction in, in various areas, whether it's in Calaveras County or if it's in Los Angeles County. So do you have a, a, a contact, or maybe you could email me some contacts of folks who have been dealing with this, like down in San Diego um, or, or elsewhere around the, uh, around the state? Absolutely. San Diego would probably be the best one I can get you in contact with some of those folks. Thank you. I, you know, I appreciate the safety aspect of it. I, I've seen uh, Cal Fire do an amazing job at that, actually, at the, uh, through the, the, the Butte Fire. Um, from what I understand, only one person uh, within Cal Fire was actually hurt, burned, right? I don't have those those stats. That's that's what it is. Out of the 4,500 folks that were here, one person got hurt, and largely because of the safety procedures you guys have in place. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that 
you guys have a great process for that. But I also have to look at, you know, what, what can we do in the future just like you are, right? So there's, I mean, I've talked to Chief White about uh, a, a program uh, for watershed management that could, that could severely bring the heat down on, on these fires <coughs> and, manage, and manage exactly what, what is causing a lot of this, which means there may be, have, there may be an opportunity for less regulation uh, because you would have less issue. Um, so, you know, when, when are we going to go towards something like that instead of just, uh, you know, com continuing to create a, a situation where we can have um, less and less people afford to be able to build a home somewhere? That's an interesting question. Um, I, ha I still have to go back on the, uh, the, the <coughs> codes themselves. Uh, the codes themselves are in place for the safety of the community as well as the safety of the fire personnel, but also the people that uh, live, work, and visit Calaveras <laughs> County and various communities throughout Cal uh, California. Um, I'll still go back to existing non-conforming or uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and that would be something handled more at the local level with the, uh, the fire officials as well as the uh, building and safety working in conjunction with planning. So for an example, you look at, um, let's say, parcel maps, um, splits and developments. There's a, uh, a redundancy built in through the planning department to look at some of the, the similar aspects that we look at for fire and life safety. Uh, Public Works will look at some things. Um, so there's a, a built-in redundancy for that safety aspect in addition to complying with uh, other government codes from the planning cycle. I don't know if I answered your question. It was an answer. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> cool. I mean, I, I'd like to comment because I... You know, there's a lot of codes here that I see are important, and, uh, you know, I know there's the expense to it, but I look at it beyond fire. Um, I've been on the medical end of things, and when you can't access a uh, house because of the road width or it's overgrown or you can't find the house number, it's very challenging for those kinds of folks to get to your house to possibly save your life. Um, so, you know, some of those things I see as, as, as good things and, you know, maybe a little overkill in some areas and so hopefully as we look forward and develop these kinds of policies, we can kind of say, you know, for the most part this works, but in this rural area, maybe we take a look at, you know, the ingress, egress a little differently. But I think in general, as I know the code, you know, there's a lot of good things in there that probably most homeowners aren't thinking of as they're rebuilding or even building a home. Um, the safety measures, it's, you know, nothing worse than being on the other end of that 911 call and you can't get somewhere because you can't find the place because of addressing or the road width or the gate or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, I know certainly fire has its challenges with those from time to time as well. But, you know, from a public safety point of view, when you look at both the, the medical end of things and even law enforcement getting into some cases, you know, you have different sizes of equipment that needs to get to these locations. And I know, you know, there was a grant, I believe, that was um, out there, and I can't remember, maybe, Jeff, it's your fire agency about addressing. Um, you know, it's such a mixed bag of addressing. Um, poor soul who has to try to figure out where they're living and what address and, and what to look for. Um, so if we can even start with something like that, I think that would make a huge difference as we kind of integrate this code into what we're <coughs> going to be doing in the future. Yeah, I have to agree with Debbie on that. The addressing here is, is something that we're working on all the time from what I understand through the JIS department. And um, I don't think anybody can argue with that, especially when you get a fire, uh, an event like this, this size, and you're bringing in people from the outside, and you're trying to tell them, here, go here. <laughs> you almost have to know where you're going to get there. And so uh, I think that's really, really true, really important part of it. Excellent point. And I think, too, uh, as an outsider, looking at um, uh, the incidents that transpired over the fall, um, 
uh, devastation, um, but there's, uh, there's the opportunity to, re to rebuild, to regrowth. Looking at the mythical phoenix rising from the ashes, it's now, um, it's Calaveras County's time to rise from the ashes. As you rise from the ashes going through the general plan, there's a general plan amendment for uh, Calaveras County. The perfect opportunity to work with uh, the land use planning program to implicate, implement these uh, mitigation measures to reduce these impacts in the future. That's, I think that is going to be the key at this point. Incorporating the uh, laws, ordinances, and regulations and standards. Um, having those ordinances certified. Um, work collectively with uh, local jurisdictions of fire officials uh, with the support in this room. Cal Fire. This is a perfect opportunity. And then Calaveras County can be on the map in a positive light. Have you made this presentation, excuse me, to any counties that have uh, followed through and done ordinances or made changes? I guess, uh, I guess I'm looking to snoop on somebody. No, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, actually, for the land use planning program, we meet with all the uh, jurisdictions, the fire agencies, as well as the uh, lead agencies uh, in the southern region. Uh, 24 uh, counties and 130 cities that we make positive contact. Uh, we make uh, we make contact and work on their general plan of their safety element and incorporate these mitigation measures. And so nobody's done anything def real definitive yet. There's a, there's a handful throughout the state that have uh, went through that process. It's a new process with uh, with the government code changes as well as Senate Bill 1241. Chief, did you want to say something? I sure do. Come on up there, Chief. My name is Don Young. I'm the fire chief for the San Andreas Fire Protection District and currently the acting president of the Calaveras County Fire Chiefs Association. For once in the history of me being a chief here, I see a cohesiveness between state agencies and local government that we have never seen before. During the Butte fire, we stood shoulder to shoulder to accept the criticism, the praise, whatever came that way, as well as stand with you folks. We can't look at what we actually lost. We got lucky. We're lucky that we didn't lose law enforcement officials, fire or law enforcement officers, firefighters. Don't look at what the loss was. Look at what the near misses were based on means of ingress and egress. When you've got people trying to come out and you've got a 3,000 gallon water tender trying to go in and there's no elbow room, uh, you don't want to be in that position. We're not trying to keep anybody from not building. Unfortunately, in this county, for way too long, far too many people built without permits or anything of that line and weren't even paying, probably even paying taxes on the structures that they had. We have an opportunity to go forward from there to make sure that this accident doesn't happen again. And I've heard it said more times than I care to hear that while we've had our 40 year fire, it's not going to happen again. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that the possibilities are just as great coming up this year as they've ever been. We really need to look at it. You've got a cohesiveness now with the, prime, or the building department local government agencies, and CAL FIRE. And again, it's, it's, an, it's an unknown entity in this county for a long time. We have a CAO that has an open door policy with the local government folks. We haven't had that before. We have supervisors that actually listen to our concerns. We haven't had that before. It's a welcome change, but I think we need to continue forward. And I think 4290 is the way to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else would like to speak? Public comments? That's def definitely true there, Peter. Huh? That's true. Definitely true on that one. Got to learn to live with it. That's why I'm so humble. Peter Ray's gentleman. Uh, First of all, I want to thank all these guys over here. And I brought it up before. And if the shoe fits, I don't get the building department, the planning department. Somebody screwed up along the staff a long time ago. One of them is addresses, roads, 
safety has not been addressed for a long time. The house numbers are totally screwed up, folks. They know it, I know it, I don't know who the hell pulled the numbers out for houses out of a hat, but it does affect the safety of the people. Another thing is I appreciate the chief over here, whatever he ranks is, I'm impressed. Uh, what are we gonna do, in a, how are we gonna fight the fire in the future? What I like to see one of these for these experts, how can we minimize the potential of fires? What can we do to the, what little we can control? Make those folks, the ones who live up in the boonies, in the bushes and stuff, how can we minimize the potential of fire? I mean, it's, you don't have to be a billionaire. You know, dummy like me can see it. Hey, I got the damn, uh, the brushes over there, that burns like hell all over the hillside. And unfortunately, all those fires are going to go uphill, and I'm on top of the hill. But I'm not just looking at it from my butt, okay? I see all over the county, Manzanilla. Unfortunately, some folks really got hurt, the property value and emotional and so on, up in the hills from pine needles and etc. I would say that I would not to take anything away from Cal Fire. Okay, not exactly on top of my Christmas list for another reasons. But uh, have the local fire chiefs. <laughs> I trust my fire chief. I trust my guys over by General and, and Valley Spring and so on. I like to have them involved. They know the neighbors, they know the neighborhood, they know where the potential danger is. 30 seconds. You so mean, <laughs> the enforcer. No, but I, I like to have the local firefighters. They've been ignored. Luckily, uh, we got a damn good fire group over there. But I live near Jenilin. But get those guys involved. Ask and talk to them. And uh, my supervisor talks to them. He listens anyway. He has to. <laughs> but. Do something about minimizing the potential danger. We haven't yeah. forgot your other request either, Peter. Oh, good. I keep bringing it up. I'll be a total yeah, ass. I, I keep bringing it. Continue to bring That's it up. all right. Uh, some firefighters I talked to a couple of years ago. They wanted 100 foot clearance around the house. The grunts who really fight the fight, they said, "Hey, you should have at least 500 feet." You can blame some, oh, that's some guy who do illegally camping. That's why the fire. You know what? Maybe I'm totally wrong. Lightning does cause fires. You can do some control. Shut up, yes? Long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I got the word, it's time for you to quit. Yes. Lightning rods in a big clearance does help also. They do it in Europe. You have 500 feet clearance. Big metal sticks up. It's going to hit that stick first before it hits the trees. Thank you. Peter. You're welcome, sir. I'd really like to see 500 foot clearance up in Arnold. <laughs> I don't know how you get on from from, from there. It's down a lot of trees. It, 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 it's a real problem. I'm Rosemary Wilson. I lost my house on Mountain Ranch Road. I was one that was living in the bushes. Thank you, Peter. But now I don't have a bush to hide behind or do anything else behind. Um, so I'm looking at rebuilding potential. What can I do? I can rebuild on Mountain Ranch Road. Or I can say to hell with Mountain Ranch Road and I'll go up to, um, to Arnold where I, I did just buy a house. Now the house in Arnold, I have been a good girl and got my numbers signs. That's going to be, that's going to be picked up tomorrow. But you know, there's just so many trees around my house, my new house. That and last week I was told, well, you don't have to worry about losing your favorite bush, which I think if we had a bush cut down up there, I mean, it wouldn't do an awful lot of, lot of good. And people in the real estate industry up in Arnold, advertising.
magnetized properties as having wonderful um, uh, privacy because of the hedge of manzanita that they have growing around the property. Now, I know, having had five acres of manzanita, that it, burn, it burns pretty damn well. So here's the thing. If I have to rebuild and I, I, I need to get information sooner rather than later, and I've, I've said this before at this meeting, but I will need to know what changes are going to be required of me when I rebuild my house, for which I was underinsured in terms of estimate to rebuild it by about 50% as it is. So, you know, if you add another 25, 30% for fire retardant, this, that, and the other, I'm going to be from a 2100 square foot house down to a, a 700 nice, cozy little little place. But on, on the other hand, if I make my life in Arnold, I've got a lot of trees. It's a corner lot, so I have that going for me. Um, but it would cost a lot of money to get that fire safe and lose a few favorite shrubs, which I would be prepared to do. So I need to know from the county what you're going to have us do in terms of rebuilding and the extra costs associated with that versus buying an existing home for which there may also be requirements in the future in terms of chopping down trees at your cost estimate, 18,000 to cut down sick trees, let alone, let alone trees that are, that, that are not fire safe. Mm -hmm. So please, please do what you can, not only to speak in, in generalities, but also to you know, work out something specific so that we can use that information to, to go ahead and decide what we're going to do within Calaveras County going forward after the Butte fire. Thank you. Right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. This is very good. We've been talking about trying to find out how not to repeat what's happened so we have a better future. And uh, I think that we're getting close to, uh, to coming toward that. One of the concerns people have, of course, is property rights. We don't want to make the regulation so, so oppressive that people can't build on their property. But on the other hand, I think we're beginning to understand how to make a home fire, fireproof, fire safe. I understand that a metal roof will allow embers to hit it without burning the house down. I understand that stucco walls are a lot less combustible than cedar or other kinds of woods or even plywood. I understand that there's coatings that you can put on decks that prevent uh, the decks from catching fire if embers fall on that. I understand that the embers can go half a mile ahead of the fire. So if you've cleared your property of combustibles for say 300 feet, uh, you still have the problem with embers. Even if you don't, even if your, your grass is mowed down, you still are vulnerable uh, depending on these factors. Also there's some factors that came out uh, regarding access for fire, fire equipment, the width of the roads and also uh, the, the process of addressing the property so that property addresses can be found. I think that's probably the cheapest, easiest fix there is, but the rest of them are more expensive. One of the ways that we pay for fire pr pr protection is by taxes. And this week is supposed to be, be kind to taxpayer week. So we have to think in terms of how can we use taxes as a way to improve fire safety. One possible consideration would be to rate buildings based on their vulnerability to fire. An A building could be really in, impervious to fire, metal roof, stucco walls, 300 feet for combustibles, there, and uh, the people are safe there. 
Uh, and then you go down to B and C, take into consideration the access, and then D, and you get down to D, 30 seconds. You're, uh, you're fixing to die. So I think that things could be done by varying the amount of taxes for fire based on the fire vulnerability. This is a new concept, perhaps, but I, I think it probably was done somewhere before. What's his name? And uh, there may be some other ideas that, that could come about by the experts getting together and starting to brainstorm and start to think out of the box. I know our Taxpayer Association really would be interested in that approach. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before you speak today, I want to thank Officer Zucchini for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sergeant, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm pretty sure he's had enough of this. He's not the only one. He was having fun. Yeah, they can tell. Joe Kelly from the abandoned area of District 1. Um, it's an odd thing. None of you were here, or none of, none of you attended it. Years, a few years ago, there was a group that was put together to look at driveways. It went over like a lead balloon. Uh, you probably remember it, though. So what I would like to ask and see if they can do something about it under the codes that are doing is and I, I think they can do it if somebody wants to come in and build a secondary house, but I see it as a very expensive thing. But we've got a lot of narrow roads, dead end roads, bridges that are narrow <clears throat> on private roads, uh, no homeowners association, no road maintenance agreement. Now, these properties I'm talking about have 60 foot wide roads on their platted map. The fences are at 13 to 16 feet. So you get a trash truck coming through, you either pull into my, on my road, you either pull into my driveway or my neighbor's driveway. After that, you're lost. You've got to go off into the ditch for him to get through because they don't stop. They're in discourteous. So I'm wondering if there's something that can be done about that. Um, these maps were done in about 1972, and apparently the county didn't have anything with the planning or, um planning commission to bring forward that, hey, you're going to have these 60 foot wide platted maps, you've got to increase them at least a two lane wide road and you can have the rest and move your fences out of the roadway. So is there anything you folks can do about that? Because otherwise you're going to have one hell of a fire hazard in the south end of the county off Pool Station Road. That's where a lot of them are. And actually we have the uh, uh, Chief Hernandez from, I believe, Battalion Chief Hernandez lives out off of uh, Oak Valley Road, and uh, I brought him on board on a flooding issue that goes across Bail and Quick Road and showed him, uh, he saw all the debris on the fence from the 2012, and I asked him, would, would you take one of your fire engines through that? He says, no. I said, would you take them over the bridge on Little Bay Lane? <coughs> no. So, there's a lot of things that happen in this county that are not being addressed, no offense meant to anybody, but need to be addressed. We need to know how it can be done. Uh, the road, uh, Pool, um, Oak Valley Road, uh, Lynn, pardon me? Okay. Low, um, Oak Valley Road, Bailing Quick Road, coming in there is a mess now, and that, once again, no homeowners association, uh, no road maintenance agreement. So. There's a lot of problems that need to be cured. I don't know if you folks are able to cure them or not, but thank you for your time. <coughs> Bonnie Newman, Double Springs. Um, I'm assuming that 4290 is a state ordinance, a state code and that 1270 is a local ordinance. And I think probably everybody in this room is in favor of adding the local ordinance over the and above the state regs because it gives us a higher uh, feeling of safety. It offers additional protection. 
and um, I think it's ironic that um, we're considering a local ordinance over and above the state regulations that will make us safer in regards to fire, but we're not considering the same thing in regards to the asphalt factory, which we were asking for an additional local ordinance over and above the state regs to add additional protection and safety for the residents. Not just ironic, maybe even hypocritical. Any other public comments? Are you guys going to serve dinner tonight? Yep. You're lying. Mark Bolger, Mountain Ranch. I know it's been a long day, so I'll make it quick. Um, as someone that lost a dwelling in the fire, I had a 120 feet of clearance around my property. Um, the roadway was perfectly sufficient for a water tender to make it up, which they did after the fire had moved through. It was explained to me by several um, fire captains or officials that were on the scene that there was no way they could have sent a crew up there because the fire was moving too quick. I was at the base of a steep canyon. It would have been sheer suicide for them to send any ground crews up there. Um, I understand the uh, thought process behind these regulations. I'm not against them, but I would like to see what Supervisor Edson um, had brought up, you know, watershed management, tackling uh, the undergrowth, the fuel issues that were the root cause of this fire. And um, as someone that I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford to keep those properties, I would like to be able to sell them with someone that doesn't feel that it's not cost feasible to have to rebuild there because of um, regulations that would put cost, uh, the burden of cost on the property owner. Thank you. That makes me excited. <laughs> made day. Yeah, you made my day. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other public comments? Great. Um, oh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, just uh, for clarification, looking at the uh, uh, the codes that are, are currently in place. Chapter 8 of uh, Calaveras County um, Municipal Code identifies uh, 4290 as well as 7A, uh, the codes, uh, California Fire Code 49 as well as 1270. So this process is more or less just a change effective uh, January 1st, 2016 for the recertification aspect. So looking at 1270, but also uh, taking a look at the uh, uh, the information and going through the process through the Board of Forestry for certification of those ordinances. <coughs> and the new code cycle will change in uh, 2017. We'll have to go up through adoption from the uh, model codes. And there'll be the opportunity for um, Calaveras County Building and, and Safety uh, Fire Department to uh, take a look at those codes and make them local amendments. But there was a lot of good uh, public comment today. Um, the gentleman that that was just up here talked about what could we do. I think this is a perfect opportunity, as I mentioned before, looking at the land use uh, planning component, looking at the general plan, looking at the recommendations from the Board of Forestry to look at those existing non-conforming uh, dwelling units, so those existing non-conforming areas within the county, provide mitigation measures to reduce those impacts long term in the future. I think that's the key at this point. So there's a number of challenges, like I mentioned, existing non-conforming, um, but uh, we have land use folks working in conjunction with uh, 12 McCalaveras Unit Chief uh, White, and we can move forward. But uh, in closing, on behalf of uh, CAL FIRE, um, half the Office of the State Fire Marshal, Board of Forestry, we thank you for your continued support. Good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. One quick summary, and I think this is worth bringing up. The, we have, as you well know, been uh, bringing in some middle <coughs> Early on, I had a meeting with the designers, and I, re I did uh, bring you up to speed on that. The designers, the architects, the people that are uh, uh, reliant on to pr produce plans that do comply with the code. We've had these meetings with them. They know what the codes are. They know what they can plan when they get together with their client to explain to them what those uh, building requirements are. We're talking about minimum requirements, by the way. The code is minimum requirements. Those codes are in place, and those are the codes that we are now doing plan check with. We've been doing 4290 since 1992. We've been doing that. We have that ordinance in place. It just needs to be recertified. The other codes that are in place now are the laws that are the codes that we use, and we are plan checking for that code. 
we have had people come in and ask, what can we do to make our, uh, our rebuilds safer than they were before? We want to protect ourselves, we want to protect our neighbors, we want our neighbors to do the same thing to protect us. And this has been the general attitude of the public. We've even had people ask us to come out and look at their driveways to see if there's improvements that they could make and modify things to make things better. They need to know because they're in the process of, uh, of reinvesting their lifetime in something that they're hopeful will, will maintain itself. So that's, this, the goal is to su succeed, not create something that is not going to be successful. These laws do that for us. They, they are in place. We are using them. And we have been receiving some good acceptance from the public on understanding what this means. So the fact that we have the cadre of uh, people here that showed up today is very impressive to me. This is a big deal. And I think that the county has the obligation to the taxpayers, who are picking up the bill on this, by the way, as making sure that we pay attention to what can make a condition not at risk any further. This is, again, this is not designed to give people a bad time. It's designed to walk away from something that is, can passively take care of itself by construction methodology. The roads are a small part of this. There's other ways where a road doesn't work that you can mitigate things, come up with other kinds of issues that uh, can be mitigated. It's what we've been doing since 1991. So we're familiar with it. So I just wanted to make it clear that these laws are the laws that we have and the codes that we have been using. And the public is receptive to that. It's, it's not that we've got very little pushback they just want to understand what they can do. Does it cost more money? Yes. Did the Butte fire cost money? <laughs> I think it probably cost more than anybody would have ever imagined. So to avoid having any repeats, we can't make things perfect, but we should recognize the opportunity to do a better job and make things uh, survive under as many conditions that are possible. We have afternoon fires and fire season that create the same kinds of problems, only for four or five hours or maybe a day or two. Those problems are still present no matter how big the fire is. So again, this, the design here and the participation of uh, the people here in this room, all I think, everybody is headed in the right direction and a good understanding of what we can do to make things better is what this is all about. Thank you. So Jeff, in your opinion, what, what do we do next? Well, what we do next is we have to, we're bringing in submittals, and this is basic, basically what we have to do is look at these case by case on their own merits. Some of these, as the gentleman who spoke who lost his home, the conditions were such that nothing's going to stop the, what happened. It just, that happens. But we can avoid him having this problem again by understanding what would give him the best opportunity to protect his, his home passively. The fire goes by, the house is still there. The fire goes by, the house is still there, no matter how many times it happens. So by uh, building out the infrastructure from within to where the fire zone is, is a good place to start, to start taking advantage of, well, what, what do we do with this fuel? We don't want this fuel load to come back. And Supervisor Edson's right about the problem with the fuel. And that's what is what one of the big things is. If we get rid of the fuel, we get rid of the heat, we get rid of the oxygen, then we can get the fire out. And the end, uh, uh, there's a lot of other little things that go along with it, but it's 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 simple science that can be um, with a basic approach will uh, provide for the safety of the public and the safety of uh, the emergency personnel. So it works. It really does. Mm -hmm. I don't see uh, an issue with it at all. I, I think moving into the future, is probably, it, it is absolutely the way to go. But um, what, we have a, a, a tendency to drop uh, rules and regulations on people that are currently in a situation where they're never going to change their income or anything like that. There's people up here that, that have been living up here. They retired up here. They're on fixed income. And it's going to be very hard for them to put out a large bunch of cash to be able to make changes. Mitigation is, is a good way to go. I think that moving in that direction is perfect. I think we need to do that. Um, 
but um, I also know that there were <coughs> houses that had 300 foot of clearance that had sprinklers and all the other all the other new building code requirements that uh, burnt to the ground too so so yeah we need to move in, in that direction obviously um, I just uh, I, I just hate force feeding people when when they can't afford it and, and if we can mitigate that somehow and help them afford it great I'm, I'm all for that you know I want to see safety just as just as much as you do or just as much as these gentlemen do they're they're here for that and I, I, I appreciate that I appreciate them coming um, I worked uh, very closely with Josh White <laughs> during the fire and I know his passion for um, for uh, safety and, and and the damages that that occurred here and he don't want to see that happen again ever and neither do I so uh, you know I appreciate the fact that we're we're coming together like this like Chief uh, Young said uh, he, he sees it as uh, you know a, a time in history and uh, I'm very happy uh, that we're doing that and, and fine let's let's move forward with it and find ways of making things better but let's just be careful that we're taking care of uh, not pushing people out and taking care of the people as we move along That's yeah and I, I, I want to make it clear that that is certainly not the intention of any of the regulations it, it, it provides an opportunity to understand um, the best opportunity for any kind of investment mm -hmm. to have a long-term payoff. Yeah, when you're, uh, you know, doing new builds uh, because somebody's coming up here to buy a piece of property and they come to your building department and there's all that's required, that's one thing. They know that up front. And I'm, I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, they know it before they buy the property. So I appreciate, um, appreciate you bringing these folks together. Um, three days before you leave. Well, <laughs> you know, that's I'm still I'm doing, doing my job. <laughs> and uh, I certainly appreciate the inclusion of all you folks. I'm glad, you know, welcome uh, to Calvary's County. I'm glad you're here. Um, and uh, we, I think we've, uh, through this fire, we've actually, I'm, I'm believing that we have uh, broken a little ground here on working together and uh, doing things to, uh, to help us in the future because we've only burnt like a quarter of the, the county so far right we still have three quarters to go <laughs> we don't want to go do that <laughs> so well now's the time for um, uh, the awareness yeah. and every there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle yeah and we leave no stone stone unturned because there's a lot of ways to um, give everybody the best advantage and I think it's that's what the collective measure of all the uh, efforts will be. Uh, there's not just one hard, fast rule on doing a certain project. There's there's other ways to look at um, the preventive measures being put in place that meet the same overall practical effect. And it's a reasonable thing to, to uh, acknowledge and, and accept. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, quick note, I'd like to thank every fire personnel and our public safety for attending, especially the folks I've worked side by side with. Chief Johnson, Chief White, I worked in the courts with our chief over there. You guys did a great job. Um, a testimonial to what Mr. White was saying, I did have a project in Murphy's, um, quite a large project, uh, a new home construction, and there was the access road, was through some right-of-ways. We had some help with fire departments up there that came back out. Uh, we looked at that working with the building department. We found out we had to put in turnarounds, things of that sort. And once again, the new prospective homeowner uh, welcomed that. He yeah. was serious enough so the plan works. Uh, but I do have one request of, of Cal Fire. Uh, in my district, in District 3 up in the Arnold area, uh, up above that and down below in uh, Murphy's area, we have a very important issue with our dead trees. We have uh, pine needle problems, things of that sort. We have uh, inroads and advances towards buying certain types of equipment to take care of that, specifically curtain burners. And we're coming across a, a bump in the road that Cal Fire has allowed the use of a curtain burner in Tuolumne County, and we're looking at getting that in Calaveras County but there's a limitation on the burn months and burn dates 
when they cannot use the, the curtain burners. Uh, plans are that they would store that material but not use the curtain burners. Is there any way that we can get together and working with the governor's task force also, this is an issue with them, to find a way that we can use those curtain burners during those high fire months in a protected area? And I don't know. I'm not a fireman, uh, a firefighter. I, I don't know what your criteria is in making those regulations. But I think working together like we're, like we're doing right now is going to take care of a very big fuel problem, especially in my district, especially in Chris Wright's district. Um, and it's very concerning to our people. Uh, we are very fortunate in District 3. We dodged a bullet, but we came close. Uh, and I don't want that to happen again in this county. I don't want that to happen in my district or any other district. So please, let's get together and talk about this, find a solution for this. I've got private people that will go out and spend the $140,000 to buy that curtain burner, but he can't do it without a permit and go-ahead from Cal Fire where he can make that thing at least cost-effective for him to go out and purchase that. The county itself, we are looking at that type of situation. So we, we really need help on this one, gentlemen and ladies. We really do. Sir, my name is Jeff Isaacs, Assistant Chief for the Southern Region Land Use Planning Program. I'm assigned to the uh, Tree Mortality Task Force as a liaison for the Arcal Fire units to the task force. The questions that you're bringing up are questions that uh, our working group, uh, regulations working group, is working on. So I can work with uh, Chief White and Chief Freeze. Once those regulations and answers to your questions get identified, I will make sure I pass that on to those gentlemen. Thank so you they very can much, forward that Very for important. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for letting me speak again. Um, I'm wondering, I haven't got around to drawing up a plan, talking with a designer, a builder, or even going along to the Mountain Ranch community meeting that was held. So is there a, a, a document, I think Chris, a few months ago may have asked, or someone asked whether there was a simple leaflet or such to listing out the requirements. I know, I know I've heard that it, it's, it's not a cookie cutter thing, that it's a, a, a case by case basis. But is there a list of things that, that are required of new build, or builders building after the fire that can give me some idea of the incremental cost or the, 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 the steps that would be required now. Jeff? Well, to answer that question, the, the, the uh, cost is not something I could tell you what the cost would be. However, with some idea of what your plan is, if, if we have something to work with, we can identify the features of that structure that would be required by the code to meet those minimum requirements. Then the costing would come from the uh, construction professional. So there's not a shopping list, but there is an a, a opportunity for us to look at your uh, design to do a review to see what would be uh, <coughs> key factors in that design that you could look at that it would help you uh, uh, with the construction. Most of the stuff is approved by the fire, State Fire Marshal's Office for construction as it is. Most standard uh, building materials. So it's not like you have to go out and find something special. It's just the listed materials that are available through the State Fire Marshal's Office are identified through their website plus our office. And it is pretty common, the, the, the materials that are used these days. So it's it's not like reinventing the wheel. The, the stuff is uh, has been tested and it shows that it, the, the uh, whatever you want to use may probably work. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get this to, to, to become a chicken and egg situation, but it sort of it sort of is. I'm, I'm think I really don't have have much of a clue in terms of what I see going on my property. But are we to take it that a standard 
there is such a thing as a standard mobile home modular, although they have set they have set requirements. Because it's getting late and we're way off. I mean, we're not way off topic, but kind of. Um, the best thing to do is work with your uh, building department on that. Um, they're they're going to be able to answer all your questions. And then if they can't, they're, they'll direct it to the other departments they can. That's the best thing to do. Have you talked to uh, Calabrese Recovers Group yet? Um, I've registered. They haven't spoken to me yet. Okay, because if, if you go up there and talk to them, they could, they could probably help you through that process. But if you're, if you're looking to rebuild, though, I mean, talk to the building department. Because mm -hmm. I think that's what you're telling me. You're looking to rebuild. Or I'm looking to see whether, whether it's, it's worth my yeah. while. But I, right, Jeff? I mean... I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a regular, it's a regular roof on a modular, a modular home adequate. Does it have to be replaced by a metal roof? Those are the sorts of things oh, okay. that I thought might be able to be generalized to a lot of different mm -hmm. houses that you could, you could tell whether or not you had to go with a metal roof or whether you had to go yeah. with a, a regular roof or whether you had to have special drapes inside your house which was mentioned in the in, in in the fire plan from last week i mean there was a lot in that fire plan yeah. Fabric, fa uh, fabricated housing manufactured housing in the state of california by and large meets the requirements of uh, what the building standards are so if you're looking at a fabricated uh, fabricated house or manufactured house in california they are aware of how they can put something together that would suit uh, budget and meet the requirements. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And there's a bunch of them out there too. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the Good question. questions. All right. So any other questions from the public? Public comments? All right. I want to thank you gentlemen for coming and it says here that we have to accept your presentation. We did. We love it. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you folks. Thank We're you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate you working with our, our local folks. These guys, uh, uh, you know, helped us out a lot in the fire, and I uh, appreciate you working with them. Let's make the rest of it real quick. Okay, let's uh, combine 6 through uh, 24. Yeah. We can do that. See how fast we can do this, all right? Okay. Um, All right, so let's move on to item number six on our agenda. That's the third agenda item for the day. Um, adopt a resolution directing the uh, uh, clerk record in place the Resource Conservation District proposal on the January 7th, 2016 ballot. Who's going to speak? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Uh, we have a couple of coming. Just teasing, just teasing. So, um, who's doing it? You? <coughs> oh, I thought Brian was. <laughs> Where's Brian? At? I'm not really sure. Um, well, we can read the document. We know what we're talking about. Let's just go ahead and open up. Our... <coughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, we're, we're bringing this forward. Uh, uh, Calvary County is one of the few counties in uh, the state of California that doesn't have a resource conservation district, which could help us out in many different ways um, through just what we actually have been talking about. And uh, um, everything from uh, flood control to, you know, fire safe. I mean, everything. I know, I know that sparked a really nice one there for you, Joe. That's great. And so, um, uh, it, it's 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 also the, the the neat thing about it is is it, it is it is able to help uh, not only not only uh, uh, interact with federal federal land state lands but also with private property 
uh, owners, and that is uh, that's that's uh, kind of what's missing, I think, here uh, with the county. So, and, and just to a little bit of background, on September 22nd, there was a presentation to the board regarding the formation of an RCD, and the board. Um, <laughs> Uh, approved a resolution um, of application by the county to LAFCO. Um, the LAFCO proce proceedings, uh, they went through what they normally did and um, leaving only the call for the election. And that was what the resolution here today is, is the next step in the process and that's to call for an election. Okay. Any public comments? Joe Kelly, having read the uh, California Resources Conservation District Director's Handbook, I have a few things I'm a little concerned with. This is like putting, turning loose a bunch of mice into a chase for money. Because having a plan on page 47, having a plan is great, but without money, the plan will never be implemented. Therefore, it is imperative that funding be obtained. Fortunately, there are numerous ways that a district can get funds. Take, this takes creativity, persistence, hard work, dedication, and recognition that is not only an ongoing activity, but also never ending. Property tax assessments. Tax assessments are a vital source of funds for some districts. However, the passage of Prop 13 in 1978 significantly curtailed a district's ability to derive revenues from new property tax assessments. New assessments require two-thirds voter approval within the district. Fundraising activities may include holding fundraising drives, appealing for donations, gifts and project sponsorships, accepting funds from community and family foundations, special, event, excuse me, special events, tree sales, bake sales, golf tournaments, walkathons, receiving fees for admission to a dinner honoring a guest, selling conservation related items. The board ensures that the district holds fundraisers that can withstand ethical scrutiny. Now, I'm a little concerned with uh, this thing. A um, whole lot more in there. Talks about grants of federal, state, and all the other. But uh, what I'm concerned with is this is a uh, RCD, Resource Conservation. How does that differ from an NRCS, which we have one to the south at Tuolumne that used to do an overlay for agriculture and uh, agriculture conservation easement program and wetland reserve easements? That they used to come in and overlay our area because we didn't have anything. But now in the NRCS, we are tied in with Amador with Amy Roca. So how do these, I, I know there's a difference in them because these folks said if, if you're trying to do a wetlands easement and sell your property, they had said other things I've read have said, well, we will uh, appraise your property. Well, they no longer appraise the property. They've got set standards, and it's set standards in uh, uh, the Sierra Meadows, which Calaveras has included, for irrigated, irrigated pasture and wet meadows, $3,600. Sierra Meadows dryland range, $1,280. So how, does, how is this going to work? How would this work to assist me? Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. Brian Moss, afternoon. Administrative Office. Sorry, I was listening to this on my computer and somehow missed it. <laughs> so, um, on the RCD, um, first I'd just like to quickly give a little background on it, if that's okay. I already did. Okay. Um, the difference between NRCS and RCD, that's the only question we need. National Resource Conservation District and Resource Conservation District. The NRCS is something that my understanding is is a wide base group. Um, NRCS is currently in Amador County. And um, opportunities come to local RCDs through grants. Um, uh, NRCS is involved with that as well. Um, the one thing I wanted to really stress, though, for for this topic, um, that unfortunately doesn't really address Joe's 
question, but this is something I, I've been hearing out in the community, and I want to stress this. With an RCD, there is no proposal to develop taxes to support an RCD. I know the board's aware of that, but I want to just reemphasize that an R the RCD, as proposed, is not intended in any way to levy any kind of new tax on, on the public. So I do want to say that as well. And again, NRCS, by the way, is working with us with Butte Fire Recovery. <coughs> Um, and that is something that Public Works has been working with as well. So I apologize I missed the beginning of this. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. I, I just have a question in process because I get asked this a lot. So, you know, um, <clears throat> today, we're, today we're approving a resolution to put it on the ballot. Yes. So what does that mean? Does, is Calaveras County then the supporter of this and pays for it to be on the ballot and is out there um, trying to, to solicit the vote to approve such a thing? Or does a separate entity get set up to do this? Or does it no. just go on the ballot and different people it, go it, out and speak about it? I mean, great question. Um, it, it's not something that the county proper would sell to the community, number one. Um, I can tell you that it's my understanding that the grape growers, people like the grape growers, um, the Farm Bureau, Cattlemen's Association, and others, and speaking um, with Bob Dean, are, are um, very supportive of this effort because they see this as good land use management, good agricultural management for the county, and good agricultural management for our ag industry. So this is, I would call this an ag-friendly uh, proposition certainly so they're they're well aware of it and again um, speaking with mr. Dean the other day just giving me a little bit more background um, he stated that because I, I you know had similar questions because um, certainly as a county um, certainly as administrative office and otherwise certainly cannot go out into the public it's not our job to go out and, and pursue this um, but as far as a resolution to put it on on the ballot um, certainly it'd be something that, quite frankly, co the community that is behind it would really need to educate the rest of the community that's not aware of it. Okay. So zero dollars from the county goes into this to put it on the ballot. Well, that is actually um, not 100% true because there's going to be a cost to the county to actually place it on the ballot, and that includes... Um, uh, actually modifying the ballot and that actually includes staff time as well from the clerk recorder's office and I just saw something today that came in from mid-year that, that talked a little bit about that I didn't have that information in this packet because I didn't have that information at the time so there's a minimal cost on the front end just as there is a cost for the administrative office to to bring this forward as far as we have um, there's been maybe even a cost to county council because they would have been and they have reviewed it. There's been a cost as far as LAFCO because they've been very involved as well, just in staff time alone. Okay. So yes, there's, there's costs on the, on the front end. So then it, it's, so what we're approving today is a resolution to have it placed on the ballot. Correct. And these other associations you've talked about would be carrying the message yay or nay this would be this would certainly would be my hope and it's so something it's, that again there, there's nothing right now at this point that is um why don't we let julie talk sorry to interrupt yes, please. Please. Like, I, I, I know I, i'm okay. sorry because this is something that i haven't communicated with um with with mr moss and i just noticed it today in the rcd code and it addresses your question um there is a provision in the public resources code for the Board of Supervisors to take action to make a statement in favor um, to show up in the ballot pamphlet. And I did not get this onto the agenda for today, but we do have time to get it onto the agenda before the March 11th deadline. And so the board could then delegate a, a single board member or two board members to work with staff 
um, if it wished to, to, to write a statement for, and then the county counsel's office, a if an attorney is involved in assisting the board, a separate attorney from our office would be um, writing a neutral statement, and again, the deadline to get that to um, the elections office is March 11th. So that's the further work that we would need to do to get it onto the ballot. There has been staff time, um, as, as Mr. Moss stated, for all of us to research how to put together um, a resource conservation district. I don't know if uh, Robin, to add? Um, yes. Hi, I'm Robin Glanville from the Elections Office. Rebecca Turner was unable to be here. She's at a recorder's meeting today. Um, we did figure out the cost for putting on the June ballot. We estimated it to be about $11,500 to put on the June ballot. That includes um, cost time of $3,500 and then about $8,000 for the ballot typing. Um, if we did do it in November, it would be a cost savings. So, because you wouldn't have the multiple party ballots. Um, we would have the special districts, so we'd be splitting the ballot anyway. So there would be a substantial cost savings for the November ballot. So, so with that then, when someone, so we're going to, quote, put it on the ballot. You know, my experience has been, and I'll, I'll just go back to the TOT tax. You know, typically somebody sponsored it, it goes on the ballot, and somebody's writing a for statement and against statement. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I, I don't know if there's any organization out there that's on the against side of it. So how, do, how does that work? Yeah. If there's no one against, then we would receive no re arguments against it. We'd have that 10-day period. And so it would just, no one would so file. So if there is somebody out there that is against it, they could write something for They'll the ballot. They'll file it with us, yes. Okay. So there's a process that someone goes through. There is a process. For organization to go through. Yes. So you're saying if it goes on to the June ballot right now, it's about eleven thousand five hundred dollars. That's what we're estimating. That's what, yeah. And if it goes on the November ballot, because there are more things on the ballot, it can't go on. It can't, oh, it can't go on to the November <coughs> ballot. Okay. So okay, so it's eleven thousand five hundred. Who pays for that? It's coming out of our budget right now. Unexpected expenditures. So. Out of the elections office. It would come out of the elections office budget. All election costs come out of the election office budget. And, and their budget would have to be adjusted if that bill would be coming in in June to reflect the cost. As We can do that as part of the mid-year budget, which would be a draw on contingency. So, Brian, your statement about other associations um, liking this and supporting it, would they be re could they be um, the ones paying for it? That's something we'd have to explore. Now, I will tell you that, again, uh, meeting with, with Mr. Dean, who was one of the individuals who, who initiated this movement um, and proposal, um, he, he did state the other day, you know, that I, because I asked the same question, who, who out there, because as a county, it's not our, it's not appropriate for us to push this forward. It's, it, right. it's appropriate for the community. It's a community, it's for the community. <laughs> So, um, personally, I haven't spoken with the Farm Bureau, personally, I haven't spoken with the, the Cattlemen's, and personally, I haven't spoken with the Great Birds Association, but Bob has. So, um, and I do, know, I do know that Supervisor Edson has been involved with some of those groups and speaking to them about this. Um, but certainly, it would be something that I, I don't think it's out of line in any way for county staff to, you know, inquire of those groups. You know, are, are you interested in pushing this forward? We can't direct you to or ask you to stand up for or against, but to kind of get a feeling for it. Because I think the TOT um, is a very, very good example of the concern. We don't want to just put something why, on why, the ballot. Why is TOT even compared to, to this? It only, she was only using TOT only as an example. Well, TOT directly affects taxpayers. But uh, somebody has to pay for it to put it on the sure. ballot. That's okay. my so, reference. That, that, and that's right. Somebody is going to pay for it, and the right. county should, because of the money that and the, and, the, and the programs that can be brought into the county to actually parlay a quite a bit of, quite a bit of uh, uh, savings, and, and um, especially when it comes to agriculture, for support for agriculture in this county. <coughs> but not to mention the, the, the programs that can be put out there to fire prevention and the things that we're just discussing earlier so right. 
to help uh, private property owners, to help even the county, actually. And, and with, again, how about flood control? With flood control, with erosion control, right. all that stuff. If we had an RCD right now, we would have another. Um, we would have an, another avenue of funding that we could help with the Butte fire issues that we're dealing with right now. That's why we're looking to Amador and working with with uh, NRCS and, and, and another county. So you know, I, I'm not going to debate the pros and cons right. of the RCD because I see some good with it, and I see some you know other um, concerns about the function. Uh, my concern is right now we're being asked to put this onto the ballot, right. and I'm just concerned about the cost of it. Understood. And, so. and again, the cost. Um, uh, as stated clearly by Robin, um, could be as much as $11,000 um, due to their staff time and also modification of the ballot. I just happened to see their mid-year report for mid-year adjustments uh, today after, after this was done. So um, that's very consistent with what I, I read as well. Um, and again, that's a board decision. You know, it's, does the board want to incur the cost and does the board want to incur that cost? Because it is a general fund cost. In the actual uh, cost, staff time is going to be paid no matter what. So the staff time really doesn't increase or decrease. It's just additional work. The cost is really what it costs to have the balance printed, which was $8,000. And can I, so along with that, Julie, you mentioned it couldn't go on November ballot. Why is that? There was. Uh, up with the citations we had a countdown from the time of approval to june and all of this had been timed out um, over the last several months and we put together a timeline in order to meet both the elections code we had um lafco rules under cortis knox hertzberg we had and there's there's a time pin, a window in which this can be um heard basically That's so the resources code too right in the public resources code said yeah i mean there the there has to be a certain number of days, I don't remember, a hundred and something days after the LAFCO resolution. And so everything had to be timed to a T. And I believe that the direction initially was to put it on the June ballot. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I had spoken with um, Rebecca Turner in elections, and my understanding, I'm, I hope I'm not misquoting her, but my understanding is that there was also an issue with putting a ballot measure on the November ballot, I could be wrong about that <coughs> separately through the elections code. So I don't think we can put it on, no, we can wait to November without exceeding our deadline under the public resources mm -hmm. code. One quick question, if I could, Chair. Uh, Robin, I'm sorry, Ms. Granville, can I ask you a question? $8,000 of print now. Have we already designed and ordered our printing of ballots? No, um, oh. that will be March 11th when we start getting March all that prepared, 11th. yes. So this is in addition to that existing ballot? To now. our existing cost, this That's is 8000 $8, additional. More. Yes. Just for the little, just for the little, <coughs> yes, yeah, because no. we have to do multiple ballots for the parties. And this is creating seven new precincts. Okay, I brand county wide, not precincts, expense. not by districts. Um, I would just like to state once again, I think that Supervisor Edson stated it very well, um, <clears throat> investing, investing dollars on the front end to have monies come in, not to the county, because please understand the Resource Conservation District is not the local governing body, as you know, it's a separate board. But with that said, um, the opportunities to bring in grant funds, and that's again why I emphasize no new taxes on this kind of thing, um, the opportunities to bring in grant funds, not just for a Butte fire incident, it would have been very convenient to have that now, but um, in the future, even if we don't have a disaster, uh, to bring in monies on an annual basis, some of these grants are, are very, very significant. And again, it goes to assist the community as, or the county as a whole, um, with a lot of emphasis on agriculture. That is absolutely true. And again, if you remember my original um, PowerPoint presentation, we talked a little bit about 
where this came from. It came from the Dust Bowl and the original Conservation Acts, et cetera, and then moved forward and then in the 1970s turned around again and, and became the RCD. So with that said, um, yes, we're investing some funds on the front end, hoping that this separate board and this separate district <coughs> brings in um, uh, a significant amount of funds in the future for for the betterment of, of land use in the county. Well, to mitigate some of the issues that we're having, you know, we we have water issues all over the place. We have we have the, the fire issues, the wildfire danger, the the you know, we're going to have erosion problems here, and we already are. So uh, this RCD is a, a a vehicle to be able to mitigate many of those problems. That takes a lot and lots of money and it takes a group that's dedicated really to that sort of, of effort and um, and it and the, the way it's set up it's a very balanced effort now I, I've spoken with the cattlemen's Association I've spoken with the Farm Bureau and you know I am I didn't get any uh, pushback I got a little bit of discussion on it because they were thinking that, that you know maybe there's gonna be a tax uh, involved but it's it's not going to be that way we've decided to not not do that and um, the goal really hopefully is to set it up to where we can we can build through programs some value in in what we're what it's producing and, and possibly uh, be able to even go towards a, uh, a program that that does that has to rely less on grant funding and that sort of thing so um, that's as time goes on with with water and uh, watershed management and that sort of thing that's the future and it, it, you know it, we have an opportunity to get right in, right in on the ground floor of it and and get ours going right now we're using other rcds in other counties to do pro projects in our county which cost us money that eight thousand bucks that we're going to put into that is nothing compared to what we've already paid to other counties and actually calaveras county is one of the last jurisdictions that does not have an rcd in the state of california so um it's a tried and true, uh, it's a great uh, thing to have uh, in place, and uh, I'd encourage more public comment so we can move on to the vote. Great. Yes. Well, and by the way, um, Julie? Or are we done with public comment? Chris, uh, I, would, I, would like to, I would like to say that Chris, Julie, yes. right here. Yeah. I'm ready. Sorry, I'm <laughs> so, so you were talking about how you need a couple of people to... Uh, for support language? So we would agenda, that would be board action. The board has an option under the Public Resources Code of whether or not it wants to draft a statement for. Um, and it seems like the most efficient way to do that if the board, if there were three votes to do that, it's obviously not on the agenda now. But if there were three votes to do that, obviously we, the board would want to delegate maybe one board member or, or two to work. Um, nothing has to be, you know, uh, less than three <laughs> yeah. to work with um, a staff member, possibly somebody um, from the county council's office, probably possibly somebody else to just right. put together the statement. There's some rules. So you're going to bring that statement. up on our next uh, uh, possible agenda. To yeah. For? Okay. That's sure. great. Great. Thank okay. you, Julie. Sure. Can we call for the vote. Okay. Now? Public comments. I think we already did that, right, Joe? Already talked. We already did. You already talked, right, Joe? I did, but since you had staff coming afterwards and provide all this information that I didn't have, um, Joe Kelly, I, as I said, I'm a little concerned because this now, as I find out, it's going to be Calaveras County competing against 57 counties, other counties, trying to get this grant funding to do whatever. Because if we're having a problem, they're possibly having a problem. So. There's going to be the thing I'm concerned about. There's got to be in a constant rotation of trying to get funding just to operate. We don't even know what their operation costs are going to be. The board is generously volunteer, I believe, but the staffing doesn't sound, from what I read, like they are volunteers. That is paid staff. And you have a grant writer as one member of the staff, and if it is, are all these staff members paid and what's paid employees? And is the grant writer a paid employee or a paid employee, pardon me, paid employees, and a paid employee with a grant writer subsidy? Because normally the grant writer takes a percentage of the grant. Mm -hmm. So we're not, 
I'm not, I don't know if I'm for it or against it, to tell you the truth, because mm -hmm. I've looked at the NRCS program, and then you have to go through the FSA, Farm Service Agency. I can see possibly some good in this, as long as it never comes back to go and try to override Prop 13. Mm -hmm. I can see some good, but I think it's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of people's time as board members and staff of that organization to be able to do what you're possibly thinking it can do. You've got a little more information than I do. So go, go uh, just for your own satisfaction, go to uh, the Tuolumne uh, County RCD, uh, mm -hmm. check out them, check out the El Dorado County RCD, they have two of them, mm -hmm. and then also Amador, and that's a real good uh, uh, comparison on, on where we can, you know, jump in there somewhere. So. Uh, they've all been in existence for quite a long time. They're very successful. So if a one county has two RCDs, then we have another one that we have to compete with for the funding. No, it's not like that. It's they they, they find their way, and those 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 folks uh, are really innovative. Uh, the Tuolumne County RCD has done Tuolumne County a, a world of good here, uh, and also uh, Calaveras County uh, through uh, CCWD has helped them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I look forward to see what it's going to do, but like I say, I think most people that I've talked to are very concerned about the concept of property taxes and Prop 13. So uh, yeah. that's my point. My, my point is the staffing and the members coming in to run the operation. That's a, a valid concern. I'm also very concerned about being able to get insurance up here in 10 years and many other things that we're going to deal with. And this is a good way to help us to mitigate some of those issues. I so, hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other public comments? All right. So I, I um, again, a, again. Thank you. thank you, Brian. Can I just make a motion? Absolutely, you can. <laughs> thank you. Can I make a motion to approve? I'll, I'll <laughs> second. Second. All right, good. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll second. Thank you. All right. So I'll, um, got a motion by Supervisor Wright, second by Supervisor Oliver. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm voting no, and the reason why is that I really strongly want to know about the money issue, placing it on the ballot. And um, so, again, I'm, I, that's my vote. No. Okay. So we have four. Yes, one, no. I apologize for being tardy, but thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, don't run next time. You were breathing pretty hard now, Mike. Um, okay, so we're now on, off to regular agenda item number seven. Okay, that's uh, more um, people have applied for commissions and boards. With one change on the Fish and Game Commission, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Valenti had applied in District 4, but according to elections, he's actually District 1. Right. So, so okay. uh, and each district can have two. All right. So. I'd like to keep uh, the two additional, and the two incumbents I have. The two incumbents. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's Bird and Waldir. Bird and Waldir. All right. And Supervisor Edson, do you know? Who you would like? Uh, I would like to. Uh, um, Grant Metzger and uh, Nicholas Valente. Alrighty. Everybody else is okay with their. I'm good with Mr. Mm -hmm. Oswald. Yes, I, I have two openings, so. Yes. I'm, uh, I'll be all filled up. Okay. So in, in addition to the Fish and Game Commission, now that we've had that, um, you also have the Air Pollution Control Hearing Board with two vacancies, one for an attorney with a term ending 1231-18 and one for a public member with a term ending 1231-18. There's two applicants, one for attorney and one for the public. Um, that's J uh, James Joan is the attorney and the incumbent, and the other is John Jurdle. And then uh, the Pay Commission, or Public Education and Governmental mm -hmm. Television Commission, there's four vacancies for term ending 1231-17. There's one candidate from District 1 at this time, and that's John Jurdle. Okay. And that will give them a quorum. All right. Everybody okay with that? Any public comments? 
Make a motion to approve. Second. So I got a motion by Supervisor Pondy, second by Supervisor Wright. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Good. Okay, number eight. Thank you. Judy Hawkins, Human Resources and Risk Director. Good afternoon. Today I am introducing an ordinance adopting the changes consistent with a new contract that we have with the Deputy Sheriff's Association and <coughs> offered to all the bargaining units for the Board of Supervisors. Great. And, and basically this is just an increase to the contrib house contribution that was done for the DSC and has been offered to the other bargaining units with the total cost annually being $2,743. Correct. Okay. Is it a public comment? Do I have it? Is it an action item? Yeah, number eight. Okay, can I have public comments on this, please? All right. Board comments? Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Supervisor Oliver, a second by <coughs> Supervisor Kearney. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you, Judy. Oh, you have Perfect. more? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm so just staying there. Yeah, I have more. <laughs> Number nine. Okay. Judy Hawkins, Human Resources Director. I am um, bringing before you changes for um, mm -hmm. the, uh, I'm recommending um, that the Board of Supervisors approve a resolution adopting changes consistent with the new contract for the Deputy Sheriff's Association um, and offer to all bargaining units for the appointed department heads, mid-management, professionals, supervisory, confidential, and our other group. And these changes are, uh, for those groups, will be the um, changes to the health benefits, the CTO, the bereavement leave, and the floating holiday. It will be a change of 28865 to the general fund and $33,083 to the non-general. Okay. Any public comments on this? Can you guys afford it? We can afford not to. <laughs> that is it. Any public comments? I know what the general fund is. What is the non-general fund? Those are funds like public work, health and human services. Those are the funds that are mainly federally and state um, funding is received to fund those departments. So it's not local funding. Right. Okay. Any other public comments? Does the feds approve that? Are you going to make comments, Peter? Sure. Okay. I'm Peter Reese from General Inn. If you guys feel that you can afford it, bless your heart, good. And there's not going to be any layoffs to offset things. Okay. Now, this non federal company, you mentioned somebody with federal money, uh, that uh, Boxer or uh, Feinstein, that she said, okay, fine, go for it. They're going to provide the money? The federal government has no um, involvement in our labor negotiations. They provide allocations based on county cost and available funding, and the funds that um, <coughs> we receive from the fe federal government and the state government are sufficient to cover the increased cost. Okay, simple, qu simple answer. Does the feds approve this money? Do you have it coming for sure? They do not approve negotiations. They approve allocations to the counties based on the programs and the fundings for those programs. So if the feds approve it or not approve it, you guys are on the hook for it. Yes, we're on the hook for it. Thank uh, you. And it will be uh, recovered based on the contributions that we're getting from, from the current programs that are in place through federal and state programs. Okay. Okay. 
That sounds good. Because the feds are only $19 trillion in a hole. I'm sure they got a lot of money to spare. Thank you. Close to where we are. All right. Any other public comments? Board comments? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I got a motion by Supervisor Wright. Second. Second by Supervisor Oliver. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, number 10. Judy Hawkins, Human Resources Director. I'm bringing before you today another introduction of an ordinance adopting the changes consistent with the new contract with the Deputy <coughs> Sheriff's Association and offered to all bargaining units for the elected officials. And these changes are only in the health contributions. <laughs> And um, the total changes in this cost uh, to the county is $3,534. Okay. Public comments? Is that, uh, me, is that the total contribution or per individual? That's the cost to the county. Total. No, the, the, the yeah, the total cost annually is three thousand five hundred and thirty-four dollars. Okay. The increased cost. The increased. Okay. Any other public comments? Any other public comments? Board comments? I will make a motion to approve. All right. Motion by Supervisor Wright. Second. The motion. Second, second by Supervisor Kearney. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, today I am bringing before you what is the um, suggested interview process for the appointment of the sheriff. Mm -hmm. And I believe all of you have um, the copy. Very. Yeah, it's somewhere in here. <laughs> okay. Okay. And Less of course, discussion. this is you know suggestions to be discussed, modified, and um, <coughs> we are suggesting that the human resources and administrative department will accept and screen applications to ensure they meet the qualifications required to serve as sheriff. We are already in that process right now. Um, the interview questions will be sub submitted by the public through an email address set up specifically for this process. For those who do not have access to email, they can drop off their questions to HR, just making sure that they are you know, printed and legible. And so then we can take those questions and then make sure through county council that they are legal questions to be asked by the public. That one I do not agree with. Can we, oh, can we go through the process? Yes, and then well, go ahead. We'll talk. All right. And then we can put out a notification on the county website and a pre press release to make sure everybody is aware of the email address that's been set up and the process to uh, submit their questions. Then the ranking committee will go through the application packets, interview the qualified applicants, and select the three to five candidates. The board um, public interviews um, for the top three to five candidates. The candidates will be seated up front here at the table and will be interviewed simultaneously, which will mean you will ask one person a question then they'll all answer and then the next question the next person will be the first one to answer this way you're not an interviewing just one person and then somebody sitting back and preparing themselves they'll be interviewed at the same time we, we felt that this was the most fair process because if you had five candidates four sitting in the back of the room and interviewed one all at once and then the second one all at once, the fifth person going would have the advantage because they would not only have listened to all the questions but all the other answers. By having it as a panel discussion, much like a candidate's debate, 
you ask the first one the first question, he answers first, the second one he answers first, the third, the, then the next question, the second person answers first. So it's continually rotating, so nobody has an advantage. One candidate has no advantage over the other candidate. But I thought we were going to get through this whole thing first. Okay. I was just explaining that. <laughs> I was just further explaining that right. step. Yeah. And I, I actually, I actually <laughs> agree with that one very much. It's very good. And then once the board has completed their interview questions, then that's when we would allow the public to come up. We would actually have a list of the, the questions that had been submitted and vetted by county council. And then the idea would be they would, from the list of questions, they would say, okay, question 25. How long have you been a law enforcement professional in the county? Or, you know, and then we would keep track of the questions that were being asked so then we could make sure that there was no interview question asked more than once. And so the idea was to be able to bring order to the questions being asked as well as making sure that it was legal for them in the interview process. That was the thought behind this document. Great. Okay. Thank you. I actually completely agree with it. Yes, so. I don't. I don't agree with it. Um, I like the idea of having uh, human resource. I like number one. That's good. Um, wanna, I want to know where the, the background checks are. It's probably after the vetted process, right? So who's vetting? We, we figured that out yet? Well, right now we are still receiving um, we are still receiving packets. It does not close until Friday. And one of the things is we have to make sure that those that will be uh, going, you know, and it, it's the HR and admins making sure that we have the, they meet the qualifications. Those that um, will be ranking the applicants and interviewing the applicants, we need to see who has actually applied before that process is put in place right. so we don't have any type of conflict of interest. Right. Okay. And just as a reminder to the board, number one and number three was already um, based on the board's direction from the board meeting of January 12th. So I, I do want to remind the board that one and three were already vetted and provided direction by the board. Yes. Yes. So, so number one, great. Okay. Uh, I thought actually that it would just be the human resources doing it. I didn't know that it would go through admin as well, but because you were actually in charge of human resources, so I guess that's why. <laughs> but you know. Uh, second second uh, part of this would be, in my mind, the uh, number two should be where number three is, or number three should be num where number two is, because that's the ranking committee. That would, after you have got your candidates, right. then they would be vetted through the ranking committee, right? Right. Okay. And then, after that, um, they would come to they would be ranked, they would come to a public meeting after that. Um, I think the way I feel about it is they should be able to be asked questions by the public. <coughs> right there. The problem that you, the problem that you can't, you can't, the reason that you can't do that is the public could ask a question like, do you have um, a disability? Do you have um, lupus? Do you have, have you ever, have you ever, um, gone to prison. There's many, many, many questions that are completely illegal and will end up in 1983 civil rights action okay. the next day. So you That's say, why. no, you can't ask that question? You don't want to do that because then there's, then, then you, you're opening the county and the taxpayers up to, to an unfair equal protection type of lawsuit. What are, you, what are you doing by by taking the questions earlier and deciding on which questions are going to be asked? Because then you're legally vetting them to see which ones pass. Who's legally street. vetting them? The board isn't. No. Coming council. The questions are they're vetting Coming the questions. Council. Coming council is vetting so, the questions. So, so that, that, leaves, that leaves it open to where people are thinking, okay, well, they're picking and choosing. Uh, the questions. That well, that's right. Can, we are, we are so you can, you can tailor them to whomever you wish. 
Well, not, not really, because, because it, the, we would keep a list of the questions that were rejected, and if anybody ever took us to court, <coughs> we'd be able to show why that question wasn't allowed. And that's why we wanted to set up an email address specifically for this process. It's not going to, you know, just human resource in general. We can track exactly what was submitted in to, to a specific email address. And this will also provide some order so that we're not here for eight hours through the process. We've looked at the questions. We've consolidated those questions that are very similar in nature and, and so that the same type of question isn't asked repeatedly. And as both um, Judy and David stated, that they are legally, we can ask those questions legally. And this gives some order and methodology. And it also provides the interaction that um, Supervisor Edson had expressed to me that he wanted to see between the public and the candidates. It still gives the public the ability to ask the questions that that the public wants to know because these are the questions that the public has submitted and it, it puts them on the spot because they don't know what's coming but yet it still provides order and we make sure that the questions are uh, legal in nature well, not to me it doesn't but you wouldn't be able to ask your own questions <coughs> anyway you still have to get them approved by our office same thing Ooh, that makes it a public process <laughs> doesn't it but that's how the law is, sir. I can't, I can't change the employment law. I mean, you know, it, it would be much better to do that up front, right, right out there in front of people, instead of, instead of having it go behind closed doors and then have it done. That's my issue with it. So and that's the way I feel about it. I'm not going to change. I just don't, you know, that, it's almost like, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't quite sound like a process that that is near, as near as we can get to a, 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 um, a process that the public can actually have true input on. I mean, you, they don't know, you don't know, uh, they don't know what, what questions are, are gonna come in and who's gonna be, which ones are gonna be picked, who's gonna pick who, who's gonna pick what questions. Sure. I, I, again, it, it's not a pick and choose of questions. It's if you have three questions that one says, how many years have you been in law enforcement? Another one says, what kind of experience do you have? And another one says, what kind of office um, positions have you um, held in the Sheriff's Department? That can put be put into one easy question of, please detail your experiences, your the positions held, your education, instead of three different people coming up and saying, okay, what positions have you held? Or well, how long have you been in law enforcement? Or what educational background do you have? It, it's just trying to make the, co the questions more comprehensive to so that there's not a duplication of the same question in three, as three different ways that, so we're not trying to um, uh, limit the questions or, or throw the questions out unless those questions are deemed illegal by county council. It's not going to be me deciding that we can't ask the question. It's not going to be Judy deciding. And it will be up to county council whether or not there is a legitimate basis and a legal basis to ask that question. Otherwise, the questions will be vetted and put forward and the <coughs> public can ask them in that forum. So what we thought we were trying to do was to give you the best of both worlds give the public the opportunity to ask the questions, but they have been, made, we have made sure that they're, um, they're legally able to ask the questions and that they're not repeatedly asking the same question in a similar manner. That is all we're, we're preparing to do when we put forth those questions. And the questions still will be asked by the public from the sheet in front of them. Right, and I mean, and we can, I mean, we can have as many questions on there as, as necessary, so we can make sure everybody's questions 
get, get out there. It's just weeding out the ones that, that we know that we can't ask. And then it will add also um, sense, some sense of order so you don't have somebody sitting there arguing with county council about why they can't ask this, this question. And then we can make sure that we have a good, full interview process with all the candidates and everybody feels that they, they truly you know, are getting to know the candidates out there. And, and it doesn't become a debate with the people up here asking the questions in county council. Well, it's already a debate with me. Uh, there's a bunch of me out there. So, that would be an issue, I guess we'll find out. All right. Well, and that was just the thought process behind why, why I came up with the idea of the so, email address. I'm okay with it also, uh, but I, <coughs> I do have a concern and uh, uh, want to ask this question. When we do this, and you have three law enforcement people up there, uh, or I'm going to assume they're all still in law enforcement. Um, three to five. Uh, yeah, three to five, however many it ends up being. Are we going to put all their personal information in our record? No. The, the public can't see any of the applications except for the application of the successful candidate. They'll know who they are, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you, but legally, legally, Judy can't release the application of anybody but the successful candidate unless they want to waive, waive their privacy rights, which we tend not to ask them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because the last time I asked that question, I didn't get that answer. Yeah, we don't. And I was concerned about that because, mm -hmm. let's face it, these guys deal with unsavory people, and uh, I don't want to point out where they live or their home phones or anything of the nature. Mm -hmm. Good. So for me, I'm, I'm okay with the process here. Um, one of the things, though, I'll just offer another suggestion. Um, when I was with the city for some of our um, public interview process, um, while everyone could be present in the room for the interview process and everybody heard everybody else's answer, we came to a process to where the attorney talked to everybody and more or less had a gentleman ladies agreement that the other candidates would step out of the room. So the one who was being interviewed was here privately going through the interview questions. Um, but that, again, was an agreement that everybody shared. So I don't know if that's possible or not, but that was just another way we conducted our interviews. So the one being interviewed was here more or less privately with board and public, but the other candidates were in another room where they didn't hear the answers. So I don't know if that's feasible or something anyone desires, but that's how we were able to conduct well, some interviews. Why don't we hear some public comments? Peter Rennie, gentlemen. Uh, do you folks want to get the list of what questions you cannot ask? Because I would like to know. Give me the list of questions I cannot ask the <coughs> candidate. Because if I cannot ask that question, and you guys cannot ask the question, I'll be damn sure that I asked that question when he's running for a candidate for election. I would like to know what questions are out of line for you guys. Because they're going to be my employees in a way, servicing the community. I'd like to know what questions you cannot ask those people. Because if you limit it, I will not be limited. And if he's going to get his butt up to get elected, I'll make sure I ask those questions. Thank you. Bill McManus, Calaveras County. Um, I agree with most of what what was said about the, uh, the, the process of, of getting questions together, making sure there's no duplication, making sure that you don't get people up here pontificating, making political points and all that. At the same time, I, th I think there's a mistake being made that these people, this is not a candidate's night. These people aren't being interviewed for an election, you know, and from the very beginning, you know, I've, I've asked this board to just just exercise your constitutional, state constitutional requirements. There's no requirement for any of this. And I know, Supervisor Edson, you want to get it close to the people, 
but this board is supposed to re is supposed to pick a replacement and it seems like this board has gone kicking and screaming to finally get to this point where we can't no we're not going to have a special election we're not going to have anything else appoint someone we need a sheriff more than we need uh, some sort of uh, a melodrama in public of asking questions you guys can pick the sheriff now I know it's an important issue and I know you want to keep it close to the people but letting it go to the public is just is this going to be chaos and I think it disrespects the candidates uh, who have put themselves forward questions can be asked that may have, if they were to be chosen may affect their ability to do the job but we need a sheriff first and that can be done by you just doing your job and that's appointing a sheriff if it's so important if you want to take it to like an election uh, what would you say if I ask you to put the uh, uh, pot regulations on the ballot no you're gonna, you're gonna make that decision you know I think that's an important decision uh, do the people get to vote on that I'd like to see that so I you know I I appreciate what you're trying to do and, and make it to get it closer to the people but we elected you to do this job this job is specified for you to do and I don't know why you're so reluctant to do it because to me that tells me none of you want to do the job that you were elected to do as a supervisor I know it, it's probably really rare that the counties go without a sheriff or someone someone dies in office but uh, that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that yeah it's an odd obscure thing and you're you're stuck with it so why don't you just get on with it and uh, you know I'm sure the public will have a chance in a couple of years whoever's selected they do a lousy job they're not going to get elected sheriff if they do a good job maybe they'll get reelected that's what the process is about thank you <coughs> Marty Crane Valley Springs um, I find myself agreeing with uh, Mr. McManus. However, if we are going to be doing this public interview process, I certainly appreciate what Supervisor Ponte said, um, because the, if the goal was to ask them all the same question going down the line, I don't know how many there are. I was very disappointed when you felt the need to go outside of the county on this uh, issue. At one point, I believe you decided to advertise outside of the county. Um, but so I don't know how many people are going to be there and by the time you ask the first one and you get to number five he's had time so I like the idea if this is what you're going to do to have them step out for the interview but um, I see some value in what um, Mr. McManus said as well you actually cannot go outside the county I know they have to live here I, know I, I don't know where that came from I was in these chambers when you all talked about wanting you Supervisor Edson and I don't know how it so many times stuff gets thrown back and forth that you sometimes lose track of what you actually voted on but it was my understanding in the at the end of the day that you had decided to go uh, advertise broader outside of the department maybe that's what it was outside of the department Pardon. okay that, so, that, that was regardless, correct so I'm just wondering I guess how many people are going to be up here do you have a clue? We don't, we don't know yet because the, it I'm doesn't close. Back. It doesn't close until Friday uh, of this week, and the most we'll have is five. The, it will have somewhere between three and five based on the ranking committee. And, and okay. you're correct. What you okay. heard was internal and external candidates, meaning within the department or outside the department. But the requirement is still okay. a county resident. Okay, because I have a lot of faith in our current law enforcement and I hear it all the time in this in these chambers how much we appreciate them and we value their expertise and their dedication to Calaveras County so I'm a little disappointed that we felt the need to go outside the department so, thank you. Okay. Okay. all right any other public comments comments from the board I have comments chair okay I personally agree with mr. McManus and Ms. Crane, sitting in those interviews in a law enforcement capacity, I have never been subject to a public interview, whether it's hire or promotion, although that's my personal feelings. I do have insight on how 
that affects the individuals being interviewed. I agree that a mass interview of three to five candidates all in the same room asking questions, I have a real problem with that. I have a problem with the folks that are witnessing that interview process. But then again, I've never appointed the sheriff. I've been witness to electing a sheriff, but I've never been charged with the duty of appointing a sheriff. And Mr. McManus is right. That's our job, whether we like it or not. We're trying to make it fair to the public. We tried to make it fair by running an election this year. And we found out the law would not allow us to do that. Yeah. After many, many hours of discussion, both in, on this board and off this board, and I still am waiting a, a decision from the Attorney General's office, which I know is going to come back probably reflecting that same decision. It'd probably come back election year. <laughs> <laughs> but I also recognize the desire to make public part of this appointment for three years. But once again, law dictates that we don't have that privilege as board members. We're trying to make this as fair and easy as possible. Sometimes you just can't do that. Still trying to act within the confines of the law. Um, the procedure is good. I think the, the vetting of, of an outside board to give us a resulting candidate group of three to five is a good idea. That's going to be held and not open to the public. Correct. But not even, I don't not even us. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have the three to five board. No. no. The, three to, the the board directed that the three to five the the ranking board the three um, ranking board would be made up of sheriffs or command staff from like size counties that did not have where there was no conflict of interest. So, for an example, if somebody from Tuolumne County had applied for the job, we would not have the command staff or the sheriff from the Tuolumne County sitting on the ranking committee. I agree with that. That's what I, I, yeah. I must have misspoke. I'm sorry. No, I agree with that policy. It's just the, uh, I, I, would, I would really push for the fact that if we're going to interview the final three to five candidates in, a, in the manner described here, that they should be interviewed singly, not as a group. And we would have to get agreement from the candidates because it is a public meeting, so there is no way we could bar them from the meeting should they want to come in and listen to the yeah, interviews the of the previous candidates. Um, and that was why we had suggested the rotational questioning through the panel. If we can get agreement from the candidates that um, they will stay outside the board chambers, they will not listen to the, the board meeting going on via the internet, um, that's one thing. That, that was the only issue that we recommended the panel discussion is because it is, in fact, a public meeting and there is no way to bar them unless they all agree to do that. Uh, I would have to defer to Supervisor Kearney. Your extensive experience and expertise in, in the private sector in interviewing potential supervisors and candidates for promotion, even hiring. Have you ever gone into a situation like that? I know we are bound by unique situations. Are you asking me have I ever hired somebody? Have you, no, have you ever interviewed somebody for a position where you talked to three to five candidates all at one time? No, 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 no. There's a, in the private sector, there would be legal sensitivities for doing that. Absolutely. Uh, in the public sector, it's very common. I know. I understand that. Uh, they were, they were talking about forum. the questions. Uh, the first time you do a public sector interview, it's very foreign because every question has a stamp of legal approval on it, and you're restricted. And uh, I can still remember stumbling through that, uh, wanting to. I've hired over a thousand people for jobs in my life. That was very hard for me to turn in the middle of the stream and do this a different way. Uh, I've, I've got it down now, but I understand completely what David's saying. Uh, uh, that the questions have to be vetted and uh, uh, stamped, and uh, 
uh, it, I know that that's the way it is. We can't let a well, you want to make sure they're legal and, right. you know, I, I mean, we're sitting here at 6 o'clock and I think eight hours of our day we heard a lot of redundancy. So it would be nice to have questions that are kind of, you know, similar in nature to be placed together. And I, in I don't have a problem. To, I'm sorry. In fairness to, to all concern. Yeah. And I, I don't have a problem with having questions submitted by the public to be vetted, <coughs> qualified, and listed as interview questions. Sorry, folks, that's how I feel. That's all right. And if the board has concerns regarding the panel versus individual interviews, we can once we know who the final candidates are, we can have that discussion with them mm -hmm. and, and, and see what they're willing to do. If they're willing to sit out and it's the board's preference to do one interview, then another, then another, we and they agree to that, we can. It, it was, again, our concern that there's a public meeting we could not ban them from the meeting without, it would have to be just an agreement of all the candidates. No, I, I, yeah, we did that and then they drew a number out of the hat and that's how they kind of decided who went first and so on and so forth. So, yeah. you know, right. generally the council talked to them just to make sure everybody got the same message and it was kind of, like I say, more of a gentleman slash ladies agreement. I, I, I would concede that, but at least give them the option. So our, then do we have consensus from the board that the, uh, that we will follow this process with the one exception of being that we will, once we have the candidates, we will determine whether they're willing to remain outside of the chambers while other candidates are being interviewed. And if not, then we will go to a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. I would support that. On the same page on that? I am. Yeah, I'll support that. But boy, we have really got to be on the spot with the questions we ask. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there can't be any deviations between but, candidates. That would be correct. You would have to ensure that the questions were asked as they um, were presented or vetted um, because you can't have the deviation. If you, uh, if you have them all then you, and you deviate from a question, then all of them get to answer the deviated question. But Now I have a question. So as far as you know, putting together an agreement of them stepping outside, is that only for when the board interviews them and not when the public? No, because then it's going to be very difficult for the public to ask the exact same questions. Why, why don't we wait until uh, we get the, the final group and then have that discussion. Okay. Now, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. I am against the public asking direct questions of the candidates for our appointed chair. They can submit questions and the questions to be asked by council or by the board. But the direct contact room is, I think, is highly irregular. I don't even know if it's legal. You, you could set it up so that the that the public is asking questions, but they have to be your questions. They have to be the board's questions. The board they can't they can't make start making a preamble. It has to be exactly verbatim as you've approved them. So the questions are vetted and qualified exactly. by council and by HR. Right. Exactly. Right. Well, we will go through, and I mean the ones that are are blatantly. Yeah. How old are you? You can't yeah, ask that. We will make sure, and, and then those that we will address to um, county council to make sure they, they approve the list. And then, of course, we will take like ones and put those together and get the list. And then, of course, anybody who wants to review the questions that have come in, I will provide for them. Because we will have that in their own email. Sergeant? <coughs> Sergeant DiBasilio, potential candidate. Um, potential? Okay, candidate. <laughs> I've already go. turned in my application, so yeah, candidate. Yes, so you are. Um, uh, I had two questions, uh, two-part question. One, if there's less than five candidates, are you still going to have the uh, panel, the three-person panel? Um, because my understanding was that if there was more than five, 
then you need it to wean down to five. So if there's only five or less, are you still gonna have that review panel? Um, and the other part of the question, is not so much a question as a comment in uh, asking the questions. I agree with the public asking the questions via email. I think that's a great idea. It does get the public involved. Um, but my concern would be Personally, I think having what Judy or uh, Shirley have talked about, having a question number one, next question number two, so forth and so on, because people in this, I don't know how to put this, but there are going to be people sitting in this audience listening to this, and cell phone technology nowadays is uncanny on how fast information or questions can get transferred to somebody else. Right. So I, I just don't, don't like to it. see that happen. I just did that with your... With yeah. and that's, <laughs> but see, that's my point on how quickly it can happen. Yeah. You're preaching to the choir on that one. Yeah. So I just, just some input from a candidate is all. Yeah. That's a good point. No, I, I, I mean, I agreed with uh, what Shirley said, you know, question one, question two. <clears throat> that, that just makes total sense, right? Yeah, it does. I had a maybe a, an observation. When a sheriff runs for office, they're subjected to public questions as candidates, aren't they? I mean, when they are, and yeah. because they're okay. because they're running for office, okay. they, any questions can be asked Ask. by the public, and they can yes. choose to answer them or not. This so, is a different situation yes. where it, it's in essence a yes. job interview being appointed by the board. Yes. Well, to me, it, 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 it occurs to me that this might be the melding of those two things, that their public does have the opportunity to ask the questions as if they were running, but they're not running, but that would kind of satisfy everybody's perspectives and bring well, it together. At least they feel like they're a part of it. Huh? They need to be a part of it. Or yeah, well, like yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that's the best solution that would probably satisfy more people than upset people. So, and the the staggered question I think is ideal because that does give everyone the chance to be At on first. yeah or last maybe what's best. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay. So are we clear? I think we are. Are we clear? So, so just to reiterate, we, we will have a panel discussion. We will solicit questions from the public. Pretty close to what we already, what you have here then. Pretty much right. what we have here. <laughs> okay. So okay, then we will. See, uh, if you would have followed my lead, uh, it's up here. I'm just telling you, it's still four to one. Yeah. I don't agree with it, so you it's still four to one. Serpentine, you might. Thank you. Almost consistent. Okay. Four radical all right, number 12. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Just real, real quickly tonight, um, what I wanted to state is Charlie is not with us this evening. He's already gone home. I just wanted to let the board know that um, we have 24 licensed in MHUs right now, MHUs, mobile home units, 24 that are actually licensed in in the county. Um, also, um, things are winding down. As you know, we're on the back side of that, that bell curve, if you will, pre-fire, fire, back recovery. So um, what's going to be uh, interesting to see is that we're getting back to trying to get back to the just the recovery part. Um, we're going to start seeing building increase. But with that said, um, I just also wanted to say, um, like I stated in the meeting the other day, I want to thank FEMA, I want to thank Cal OES, and I want to thank the county staff and everybody that's been involved in this. Um, everybody's really stepped up. Um, Charlie Simpson, who has been fantastic with us for Cal OES on loan from uh, Cal OES, uh, his last day is tomorrow. So I just want to let the board know that. And uh, FEMA 12 to is one. still on campus. Pardon me? 12 to 1? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yes, yes. He doesn't know it, but yes. <laughs> so. 12 to 1 what? They're having a, um, a goodbye lunch for Charlie. Um, 
and uh, the chair of the vice chair has been invited. The other, rest of the board was not invited due to concerns about the Brown Act. Mm. Due to what? <laughs> Which, why? That's not a concern, is it? Really? I mean, we don't have to talk to each other. We're kind of used to that anyhow. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, see? <laughs> That's all right. So I, I, uh, Ray, I apologize for bringing Charlie up in this uh, report. I have my channel signed up to go, so if you'd like to uh, take my place, because I'm going to have to be back no, in the Amador. I, I would just like to go in and say hi to him and thank him and, and leave. I mean, I don't have a problem with anybody else going. I didn't know that it was just the uh, yeah, uh, uh, board chair and chair and uh, uh, vice chair. You guys, want, you want to even want to? No. Don't, don't we have an appointment tomorrow? Probably. Sam will keep Sigma. County. Well, that's right. I won't be here anyhow. Sigma. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, we took care of that one. Any, other, any questions from the board? <laughs> no. Thank you. But I agree. Thanks to everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. The board really stepped up. Yeah. All right. Um, consent agenda. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member, staff member, or interested party may request removal of an item from the consent agenda for later discussion. Any member of the public wishing to remove a consent agenda item? Number 16, number 19. 16 and 19. All right. 22 and 23. 23. Anybody else? Yeah, I just want to find out. Is there anybody a uh, member of the, the board? Number 21. 21. Okay. Now we have a <coughs> vote on the remainder of the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda. All right. Second the motion. So I have a motion by Super, Supervisor Wright uh, to, to vote on all but 16, 19, 21, 22, and 23, right? All, uh, do I have a second? Mr. Kearney? Yep. Supervisor Kearney, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. All right. 16. You needed, needed to abstain on that because of the minutes. Well, that's right. Uh, because of uh, board minutes, I have to abstain on number uh, agenda, uh, agenda item number 13 on the last vote. I have to abstain because uh, because I left early last time. Do we need to uh, vote it separately? Um, we can do that. Pull. Yeah, we do. Well, I I move to approve the minutes. 13. I second. Okay. Comment. So we have uh, a vote by <laughs> Supervisor. Oh, I need off for the vote. You, you have to shut up. That's okay. It's second. <laughs> you go right ahead. Four. Jesus. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Abstain. Passes four. Uh, one. Four. Zero. Four, zero, one. One, one abstaining. Four, zero, one. 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 Sorry, Bonnie. Oh, that's okay. Um, I pulled number 16 and number 19 because I didn't know where my question fell into this. And I'm, I, I'm thinking it's probably 16, but it could be number 19. But I'm asking about the ash transfer location on Double Springs. Um, I noticed that there's a lot of um, big equipment moving land around. And as it's undeveloped land, it's never been um, tilled or, or backhoed or anything. I'm wondering if there's anybody like a pseudo-archaeologist up there to see if there's any artifacts being moved around. Because this is old, old Indian camping grounds all on, on Double Springs, all up and down. I'm just wondering, has there been anything discovered on the site? And it's a muddy mess right now. If there was anything, I 
I would sure like to go poking around. That's what I'm trying to say, because there's a lot of good stuff on Double Springs. So I'm saying, I'm a, a, assuming there's nobody checking out what's being dug up or looked at. I would say that they have to follow the same process as anything else that has, that has to do with uh, any type of building. So they're going through the regular uh, planning process. What if I went poking around on the weekend when they're not digging? I wouldn't private recommend property. that. I, I, it's I private would not property? I would not recommend that. that yeah, it's that's not, a we construction don't area. Uh, uh -huh. If they dig a trench and you fall in and break a leg, we wouldn't want that to happen. Okay, Bonnie. then my second question is, um, is this going to be traffic on Double Springs? Because I, I, we're talking about coming in on one end of the road and then leaving on the other end of the road. And no, it's right there next to 26. They're, they're just going to, when they double up, and they'll roll out, probably roll, roll, I mean 26, roll right out on 12. So you, it's probably not going to be on the hot, on, on Double Springs. It's all nah, going to, traffic will be limited to the big road. I don't see that as, I don't see them taking that road. Mr. Boss is shaking his head. Well. Uh -oh. <laughs> I will quickly, that is something that's being overseen by Jason's shop, as you're well aware. This is the transfer station that is being um, really pushed by Cal Recycle so that they can turn the debris around faster. So um, <clears throat> as far as the environmental uh, requirements, yes, they have to meet the same environmental requirements they do with any other project. And certainly with it being the state of California pushing this project. Mm -hmm. And so also the routes for the, uh, when, they, when they start hauling? I haven't seen the routes, but obviously that's part of the planning review and you're going to be doing it in a manner so uh, the less impact you can have in the area, the better. Yeah, so. I don't see them coming. Because right now they're running down, uh, down Mount Ranch Road, 49 to 12. You know, they'll probably be pulling in there uh, dumping little trucks so that big trucks can take it out and probably head on down 12 to 26 to uh, uh, to forward landfill. Well, I noticed that most of the construction is like right on Double Springs. That's the entrance right there, though. Okay, so they will be coming in there. Probably in that, just on the, that, that entrance. So there, they yeah. won't be coming up Double Springs to go in there and then go out the highway. They'll be coming up the highway, all going all the way around, coming in and going out. Okay, I approve. Pretty darn sure. I approve so far. I'll let you know if it gets... Thank you, Bonnie. It gets ugly. Well, yeah. just knowing that this is an old, you know, this is an old wagon trail, Double yeah. Springs, and there's only been um, an overlay since somebody decided the PG&E had to build their $30 million substation. Then yeah. we had this fancy road put in, and that was a bone of contention too because the taxpayers paid for the new road so that PG&E could and PG&E did use Double Springs to haul all their big equipment up there and all the way down so if we have seen semis barreling down Double Springs 60, 50, 60 miles an hour because well you know we can talk to Jason about that to make sure that there's a route okay that's, okay. that's good Thank you. So can I have a motion? Uh, any other public comments on number six, on number 16? 16 and 19. Yes. We haven't talked about 19 yet. 16? Any uh, board comments on 16? No. No. Can I have a motion, please? I move to approve number 16. All right. Can I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Supervisor Kearney, second by Supervisor Oliveira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. <coughs> Bonnie, number 19? Oh, I think that's... Okay, okay. Okay. So, uh, number 19 is the resolution continuing the local state of emergency. Uh, can I have uh, public comments, please? Board? Can I have I'll a motion to approve? So, I have a motion by Supervisor Wright. I second the motion. So, second by Supervisor Kearney. All in favor? Aye. 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 Wake up. All right. Number 21. Who has 21? I did, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I brought this because of the changes in the federal drug uh, 
safety program that the county is part of. I just one quick question: What changes are affected? What Hawkins. changes are effective? Uh, there's been there's a lot of technical changes and update that Caltrans is requiring us to make to the um, policy to bring it up to the federal standards. Okay, and so testing procedures and different limits and who gets tested and when they get tested. There's on, on who gets tested. We have one position that's been added, which is equipment operator. That's the only change on who gets tested. Okay. And um, but there's a, just a lot of um, small technical changes to to throughout the policy. There is uh, quite a few on um, disciplinary action on second testing or refusal okay, to cool. test things like that. Okay, we'll talk about preliminary. All we have is operators are now part of the testing pool. Yes. Okay, thank you. That that that's my question. Okay. And attachment B. Um, on this item has the red line version so if you go in and look at that you can see all of the changes that were made thank you all right any public comments yes i'm all for it thank you and i also would like to see bunch of folks consider putting anybody who's driving any public vehicles elected not elected appointed whatever if you're driving a public vehicle that you're putting the community on a line, liability-wise, not just the peasant. Let's put all of them. Matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, let's put uh, all those nice state people on it. I don't care if they're so, driving a uh, test driving a Tesla, but put them all on a test. Why be prejudiced? Why be picky? The discrimination, folks. This is any and all public vehicles have that tested. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Well, okay. So, uh, any other public comments? I can tell you that that would cost a lot of money because this is for DOT, um, and and uh, the county has to pay for each of those tests. Pretty expensive proposition, really. But it, but it does. It updates pro uh, the process, right? All right, for DOT testing. Right. This right here just brings um, our policy up to the standard that is required by DOT. Now, does, do we have also have a policy where if somebody gets an accident and they and they're um, uh, operating in a um, county vehicle, that there's automatically a uh, a drug test for that? No, our current policy, unless you are under DOT, our current policy does not do post accident. No, the way that works is if somebody sure. if somebody gets in an accident, and there's reasonable suspicion, we have the right to do that under under our general drug and alcohol policy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that hasn't that rarely that rarely happens. It usually happens with the the class A and B drivers under these policies, which. Judy must do because federal law changes it all the time. Probably they'll probably change the protocol in two more years, and Judy's going to come back and say they made some other technical changes. So that's just routine. Okay. All right. So can I have a motion, please, by the board? So moved. Second. Motion by Supervisor Oliveira. Second by Supervisor Kearney. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Number 22. Thanks, Judy. Long day for you. Thank, Thank you, you, Judy. Thank you. This is a quickie. I'm Peter H. Jen Lin. I had the same question. Uh, how it was justified. Uh, the, I had a brief answer to it that any money not used is going to go back. But as I checked with the auditor controller, this department never gave a nickel back. And this is number 22. Okay. And this went up from 160,000 to 355,000. I still haven't got an answer. And I never see any, what was accomplished. I'm sure it's a very good reason. It's well needed, whatever, okay? But uh, all the good intentions, is great, but it would be nice to see what was accomplished. 
I don't care about names and addresses. I want to see numbers and how the money was spent. This is a one hell of a nice big increase. And just because it's not the county general fund, it's still your constituents' funds. There's a principle involved here. Thank you. I still would like to know a definite where and who is going to get this money and how it's going to be spent. The ratio of cost and benefit. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> That'd be a tough one there, Mary. <laughs> Good evening. Mary Sawicki, Director of Health and Human Services. This particular agenda item is because Dr. Mullard is retiring. Uh, we are contracting with local tenants who we already have a contract with for child psychiatry services. This is to um, hire through them a psychiatrist who will be working Tuesday through Friday from 10 to 6 p.m. Um, until we are able to find a psychiatrist for our behavioral health, we are required. On the issue of the money, um, Behavioral health does not receive any funding except for realignment funds. Um, the, these are built into Medi-Cal and then we receive the money back after we've provided the service. So yes, you will not see those, those funds, um, you know, like be given back because one, they're Medi-Cal funds, which is the primary funding source. And, and just to um, add to that, it's a contract for an amount not to exceed but the, o the only amounts that are paid are the portion of the contract that is actually used. That is we, correct. we do not pay out the 355000 and then require them to repay money if we don't use it. We only are billed for the portion of the contract that is used. That is correct. And if you were to recruit somebody... We are recruiting. Would, well, no, I'm, I'm so probably said that the wrong way, Mary. Yeah. But if you were to be successful in recruiting somebody, this would change the whole thing. Yes, right. that is yeah. correct. Yeah, I, it, I know that's a lot of money, Peter. Unfortunately, I've dealt with the same thing with pharmacists. And uh, when you get a contract pharmacist, the, uh, the pay, of Debbie's shaking her head, so she's dealt with physicians that you have to get contract physicians from these services. It is outrageous. How many do you have under the contract right now? I don't know. Yeah. We actually have two under contract. We're negotiating with another temporary uh, individual, but that's still in discussion. Um, so right now we have Dr. Mullert, and then um, it is our intention that with his retirement, we will then switch to this other psychiatrist who we've already had some discussions with. And this specialty is difficult to recruit. Yes, it is. And what I like about this particular contract is that there is some um, weekend and on-call and after-hour <coughs> kinds of things to built into it because anytime you're talking about child psychiatry, having someone available on a professional level is very helpful. Yes, mm -hmm. and last time prior to Dr. Muller, it's my understanding it took two years to find mm -hmm. a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very Thank difficult. You, Any other public comments? Can I have a motion, please, by the board? I move to approve. I'll right. second. I have a motion by Supervisor Kearney, second by Supervisor Ponte. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Number 23. Peter? What? 23. <laughs> we can just go ahead and vote on it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. I saw other people nodding in the audience, yeah. so I don't feel bad. How would you like to sit right there at that end of the table in front of that, and, and be with that camera all day long like this? That's why you make the big money guy. It's not me. It's You're getting an all with time. Don't fool me. Yeah. It's about the CDBG uh, block grant. Survey for uh, fire money, victims. I think, is the line of waste of... <laughs> okay, uh, the one, my question is, is HUD funds included? Any 
pot funds directly in the, not include, <coughs> included on this uh, grant. Development grant, 93,000, is all the subsidiaries or anybody indirectly, indirectly will assume the HUD's grant in this grant. Is the, is the, I think this is a California-based grant, isn't it? HUD would, would come from the federal government. And, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Barry. The Community <coughs> Development Block Grant is, is HUD's funds. It comes from the federal government. It goes to the state. Um, and then the state oh. allocates it um, based upon a competitive bid process mm -hmm. to government entities. It could be cities, it could be counties. This particular set of fund is the 93000 that you approved for the Butte fire, for septics, wells, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, we needed to change our local guidelines to match that. So this particular set of guidelines, and that's all you're approving are the guidelines. Um, we're just adding in so that we could give the money to Butte fire folks who need it, impacted, that are eligible. And then we also added a line about other disasters in case, for example, we have the slides or something like that. Then we are also able to utilize funds in the future for people who may have a different kind of disaster other than fire. So Mary, the red line in, the, in our board packet is what you've added to it. Yes. To specifically identify for the Butte fire victims. The Butte fire and other disasters. Okay. That's all you're, you're changing is the, in the guidelines. And it's our local guidelines. They have to match in order. So should we get audited that we've been, it, we are giving money based mm -hmm. upon what's been approved um, within the local guidelines. So we're asking you to match that. It's just the guidelines. You've already approved the money. Mm -hmm. Applications are already on its way out. And people have been waiting. Mm -hmm. Good. You are familiar with the requirements from HUD. All HUD programs need to be administered in the manner of further dog policies, affirmative for further fair housing obligation of its participant. Now, if you want to go a little further, take a look at that number. I would recommend you read what are those obligations and how it's affect property right. I think we had some conversation a couple of days ago with some supervisors. That HUD 30 is a clay mine, folks. Read the details. You might approve it, you might not. But you get into that, folks. That gets very, very dirty. The conditions. Please, read it. If you feel comfortable with it, vote for it. But you better read the details, folks. Because that here. is very, very nasty conditions to it. Thank you. That's why I stayed. So we already approved this. And all, all the... You don't have to make a vote, guys. It's an up yours. Because they're going to tell you of yours. That's a condition in there. Read it. I make a motion to approve. All right, so I have a motion by Supervisor Ponte. Do I have a second? Second. Second? Okay. So I have a second by Supervisor Oliveira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, we're down to. Supervisor announcements. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, I do have a, a question for you guys. Um, on the governor signed AB 21, I think it was, the cleanup for uh, medical marijuana. Right. So right now, we're, if we have a special meeting on the 16th, mm -hmm. we're going to be going over the whole ordinance basically giving direction to staff, and then that direction is going to go to the Planning Commission. Correct. But there, anything done at the Planning Commission level then comes back to us. Mm -hmm. So, and then we're going to rehash everything again. So my thought is is that there, that 16th meeting is actually a redundant meeting uh, now that we don't have an urgency. Uh, and what I would suggest is we, is we eliminate the 16th as a meeting and 
just do it how we always do, have the planning commission go first, you know, go through the ordinance and then bring it to us. I think it will save a lot of uh, a lot of time and we'll end up at the same place. Can we comment on that in this, this segment? He's asking the question. Yeah, that's what I'm asking for you guys. To, to, I, I personally have been in contact with numerous uh, constituents regarding the 16th meeting. Okay. And they have made special plans to attend. Okay. okay. So I, I think that would be okay. really a, a to do Lots that. of people. Okay. Sure. All right. Well, that makes sense. That's a yeah. That's where we're holding it at the town hall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. Right. Is that what? Ten o'clock. Yeah. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Town hall. Town hall. Did you guys? Did I just miss it? Yeah. Well, I missed the ten o'clock thing myself, but I knew it was at the town hall. Okay. Well, great. I'm not sure we put time that time out yet. I'm covering it. Huh? I just missed it. Okay. That's. I mean, we just need time to set up. Okay. Yeah. We can't yeah, get it until 7. So. Okay. We've got to go in there and set up the sound and everything. So 10 o'clock on the 16th, because everybody's uh, expecting to go, taking time off or whatever. And, mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense then. Okay. Thanks. And it'll, actually, it'll give, I think it'll give uh, Planning Commission better direction, too. Uh, yeah. I think, I think we can help set. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to think that now. I'm yeah. <laughs> help set that direction as well as maybe give some guidelines. Okay, and then uh, other uh, other report out. I, I, I went to the uh, yesterday to the state uh, task force on tree mortality. A lot of good information there. Um, working with Michael uh, on uh, on trying to get Calaveras County into this. There's right now six priority counties, and I'd like Calaveras to be seven priority counties. So because uh, they're starting to uh, kind of loosen up some funding to go to these six priority counties. And we have the same problem of tree mortality here in Calgary, as well as in Amador too. So, but I'm really, you know, trying to get them to, to include Calgary on this. So, um, it was a very informative meeting. Um, and uh, and then we also have a, a, a group um, that's a subcommittee of the Amador Calaveras consensus group uh, that is working on this issue as well. And they started holding meetings last week um, and they have one uh, that's happening tomorrow, I'll be attending as, as well. Uh, I think it's kind of one of those uh, all hands on deck because, you know, right now we have a little window of opportunity, um, but next year um, at this time we're going to see uh, probably double the tree mortality we have right now. And it's just... Well, they'll be kicking it in high gear next year. Yeah, it's really scary stuff. So uh, hopefully we can get something on the ground and going um, soon rather than later. Uh, and then real quickly, since it's almost 7 o'clock, uh, Mental Health Board um, I attended um, and the first five uh, committee as well as other things. Okay. okay. Debbie? Um, tomorrow morning there's an EMS meeting in Copperopolis, EMS board meeting. Um, I uh, attended a Highway 4 water meeting uh, last week. Um, some discussion about the R, the Resource Conservation District, and what the committee can do to to get behind it and support it, and more importantly, educate people about it. Um, discussion about um, kind of narrowing down our focus and establishing some um, projects that we'd like to see accomplished. So we'll be doing that this next meeting, and um, some discussion about the aftermath. You might say of the Butte fire and how um, they want to be able to kind of provide some input into what worked and what didn't and talk about their GIS systems and how to do a, a better job with utility integrate into a fire um, or, you know, just a, a disaster here in the county. So they're going to kind of formulate some plans and, and put that forward to the board. And also want to remind on Thursday night, um, Columbia College and um, Condor Earth Technology is sponsoring a groundwater um, watershed type presentation, Bret Hart High School, Thursday night from 7 to 8.30. And they've brought um, Dr. Ty Fiera, who's an expert in this field. And uh, they're also going around to the local high schools and doing some discussion slash recruitment about career opportunities in this area. So I want to invite the board to that and that's open to the public and that's Thursday, February 11th. 
and that's all I have currently. Okay. Mr. Oliver? Um, I attended the Chamber of Commerce function. Uh, I guess it was the awards presentation and the folks that were graduating from their classes there. That was last Tuesday. Uh, met with uh, two different organizations. One is starting a grassroots operation to teach computer design, uh, basic computer programs starting in the fifth grade up through high school. Uh, they are going to be holding what they call a educational boot camp, if you will. It's going to be a 30-hour session over five different sessions of six hours each. They're seeking some funding for that. Uh, they, have rec they have actually secured uh, location, secured internet service, thanks to Supervisor Edson uh, from Comcast. So that's a very good project. Dovetailing into that is another gentleman that's starting another program with our uh, school districts, uh, indicating that they call it a CTE program, which would be a, a central te technical education program, dealing with the trades, uh, trades like machinists, uh, skilled trades, uh, machinists, uh, designers, fabricators, cop uh, copiers, things of that sort. Uh, apparently the market now um, has a real definite need for that. Companies behind this, according to uh, the folks that are involved in this are like United Airlines, uh, Haas Manufacturing, and the desire is to build a trade center in Calaveras County where folks can actually go to, uh, if they elect not to go to college, they can go to a trade center, develop those skills, be certified in that type of work, and then opening up the job market. I'm very impressed with that. I'm glad to be part of that. We're actually folding in a presentation on the 11th of the Central Sierra Economic District uh, that we're going to be, we're, I'm the uh, committee member for, for the county, and we're going to be making presentations to them seeking their help. So I'm very, very, very excited about that stuff. Uh, we're going to be doing some work uh, tomorrow uh, with uh, Supervisor Edson. Uh, we're going to be attending the San Joaquin uh, the Central Valley Water it's the, um, District. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, uh, groundwater management. Groundwater management. Yeah. I also will be meeting with uh, Chief Mike Johnson of Evans Pass Fire uh, to discuss our upcoming problems with our pine needles and things of that sort in District 3. I'll keep you advised, uh, Supervisor Wright, of that progress. Maybe we can mirror in your county, your district. Yeah. Uh, sure. We do have a lot of things going on. Uh, we'll be taking a helicopter tour of the burn area on, the, on Friday, uh, sponsored by PG&E through the uh, Tree Mortality Committee out of Sacramento. They've arranged that. That, that last trip was actually canceled due to the weather. They rescheduled it, and that's going to happen on Friday. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought that had been I canceled. I thought that was canceled, too. They I thought that was canceled. It? Yeah, I got it. Uh, maybe they just advised you. Um, <laughs> they want to get rid of me. <laughs> when, the, when the emails came out, and we just got a re, uh, an email, I think it was... It was yesterday, uh, I think. Yesterday, or I think it was the end of last week, yeah. that, that, that it had been canceled. I think it was actually Thursday or Friday that we... Can you forward that to me? I certainly can. I, would, I really need to get my sketch. Okay. Yeah, let me know if it's happening, because I was really interested. Yeah, I, the last of us confirmed you know, that. Uh, my understanding was that they had to cancel the one for Calaveras, but um, they were still doing the one for Maybe Mariposa. Uh, Mariposa? Yeah. Uh, Maybe that was it. Yeah. Okay, if you could forward that to me. I'd, I'd I'll be sure. happy to, Supervisor Thank you. Oliveira. No, that's all I have. Okay. So where's the curtain? Quickly, I attended uh, the COG meeting, and uh, then I also spoke at the Rotary last Thursday morning in Valley Springs at La Catena. Uh, that went from there very quickly over to uh, JPA 12 Area Agency on Aging meeting. Um, attended that. Um, I was going to go to the Commission on Aging the next day, but honestly, the uh, Chess gold that I fought all week just got the best of me, so I didn't go any further than my couch that day. No. Uh, but Saturday, which was smart, because Saturday night I had an invitation from Common Ground Senior Services to attend uh, the Golden Health Awards. It was a, a really a grand evening. Uh, 
Common Ground Senior Services won an award, so did Gardens to, to Grow, Mind Matters Clinic, Murphy Senior Center, and Sierra Hope. Uh, <coughs> they also recognized a deserving young lady named Alice, Allison Epperly. She was a medical assistant. Uh, and uh, Larry Cornish and Dr. Roger Orman was uh, really a, a great evening and uh, was very, very proud to be there with Common Crowns. Uh, they all did a good job and uh, we'll recognize for it. Thanks. Okay. Let's see. So um, I'll just go back to the first. Uh, I went to uh, Calvary's, uh, attended Calvary's Recovers at 9 a.m. Um, over at the, over at the uh, church on <coughs> Church Hill. I uh, had a meeting with Calvary Says Talent. They're starting again already that evening. Um, they uh, looks like they're going to have a really, uh, really good program this year. <coughs> um, <coughs> on Tuesday, the second, um, we had a meeting uh, with the Delta College Committee to discuss how we're going to move forward with uh, uh, Delta College and, and the issues that we're having around. Um, you know, getting the classes full and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> I could say that um, the um, Columbia College has had really good success with their water uh, class. They have they had 18 students in that water class wow. last year. They had to cancel it because there's only three. So uh, you know, planting that sign in uh, Valacito I think made a big difference. And <clears throat> not only did they have 18 students, I've been getting calls asking me. Where do I go? So that's that turned out to be a really good thing. Um, <clears throat> on um, so uh, just to, to announce that the uh, Calaveras Chamber of Commerce Awards Dinner Banquet. I'm going to brag a little bit. My uh, my wife, mainly, <laughs> won. Uh, uh, Country Cliffs won uh, Best Small Business of the Year, <clears throat> and uh, due to my wife's work, hard work, you know, because really she only calls me when she wants me to do dishes now, so uh, I can't claim uh, uh, much of that success. So uh, thank you for, for for my wife, her hard work, and then also our my sister-in-law uh, Myra and our crew at the uh, restaurant. You know, they work really hard. They're down, they're at six days a week now. Um, she has worked seven days a week. My wife worked seven days a week for uh, 10 years. So um, we had to cut it down to uh, uh, six days a week because of uh, the Butte fire just took it out of her um, and she can't do it. So, and, and it, <coughs> but anyhow, so we were honored to, to receive that. And then tomorrow, uh, we're, we're going to the SGMA, uh, which is the, uh, San, the groundwater management uh, group down in uh, San Joaquin County, and also uh, Stanislaus. And, um, um, and I am going to give the watershed presentation to that group, the uh, Calaveras Watershed Management Pilot Program presentation to that group. So I'm um, crossing my fingers that it works out good. There's a lot of... Uh, people there that is, is, is that it could get exposed to that could really help us out in the future. This RCD coming up is very timely. And uh, if everything works out right, it could um, get started in a very, very good position. So, and that's all I have. Sure. Um, just a reminder that the February 23rd meeting will have the mid-year budget report. Um, our office is working on putting that together in conjunction with the auditor's office. Um, also, uh, Supervisor Oliver, you raised a question regarding new microphones for the board. Um, I did check with Evoc, our public access television manager. He said that it would be uh, to replace these microphones and they would be with very similar microphones and they would cost in the neighborhood of $1,000 each. Um, but he's. <laughs> oh, what? They would cost. They would cost about a thousand dollars each. Um, yeah, that's not true. And, oh, um, wow. he, no. and he's, he, but he, he said That's he what would. He said. What? We might be talking about cordless. 
No, he's, he is talking about very similar microphones that work with the recording equipment and, and necessary for, uh, um, but we, I will, we will continue to look into it. And just just a point of information, I priced out those type of microphones that fit into this system as compatible with this system. They were about $250 each. I'm only telling you what he told me, sir. Thank, Thank you very much. I'll have a, a meeting with Ed on uh, when we set it up on the 16th, and we can talk about it then. <laughs> I'll, and I'll bring some samples in for him. I have some. Yeah, I have all kinds of I have all kinds of mics in my recording studio. There's much. I'm much, thinking. Yeah. I'm thinking he's thinking uh, cordless because we talked about cordless before. Yeah, there's still a lot of that. I, again, I'm no expert in the field, <laughs> um, but well, that, know, that was no what he told me. <laughs> Tell us something else, and we'll pick on you about that too. Tell us not for government. Let's pick on Ed. No, poor Ed. Good. All right. Anybody else have any comments here? I do. Um, this is the beginning of the Chinese Lunar New Year, so all you Asian friends are going to be celebrating the year of the monkey. And not to snitch anyone off or anything, but I think Peter left with your binder. No, he didn't. Oh, oh good. <laughs> oh. I see. You want to see it. Yeah. Bobby, well, I was looking you wanted for to keep it. that. You dropped the dime on Peter. You, you wanted well, to keep that to info. All right, so thank you very much. Don't tell him I said that. Now we don't need a thank you. Know.